I am now standing in the shadow of the Houses of Parliament in the part of London called Westminster. It is the year of grace, 1850. Around me lies Victorian London, the London of Dickens and Thackeray, of John Stuart Mill and Thomas Carlyle. This capital city is now the center of the greatest colonial empire the world has ever known, shortly to embrace between one-fifth and one-fourth of the total population and land area of the entire earth. Although in theory there are still empires ruled by the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the Belgians, and the Danes, all of these in this year of 1850 are but satellites of the British Empire. Britain is the mistress of the seas, the empire upon which the sun never sets. It is the new Rome on the banks of the Thames. The empress is Victoria, who is largely occupied with Prince Albert in her business of breeding new litters of Saxe, Coburg, Gotha to take over the royal houses of Europe. A quarter of a century from now, Victoria will be made Empress of India to reward her for so much breeding. But for all of Victoria's wealth and power, Britain is not really a monarchy. It is an oligarchy on the Venetian model, and the most powerful leader of the British oligarchy in these times between 1830 and the end of the American Civil War is Lord Palmerston. Henry Temple, the third Viscount Palmerston. Palmerston is the man the others, the Disraelis, Russells, and Gladstone simply cannot match. Palmerston was first a Tory, then a Whig, but always a disciple of Jeremy Bentham. And for 35 years, there is scarcely a cabinet without Palmerston as foreign secretary or prime minister. In London, they call him Lord Cupid, always on the lookout for a new mistress, a regency buck, perfectly at home in a menage a trois. On the continent, they call him Lord Firebrand. The schoolboys of Vienna sing a song that if the devil has a son, that son is Lord Palmerston. Pam. Pam is an occultist who loves Satanism and seances. And here, between Big Ben and the Foreign Office, are the haunts of this 19th century devil, Lord Palmerston, Old Pan. It is 1850. Lord Palmerston is engaged in a campaign to make London the undisputed center of a new worldwide Roman Empire. He is attempting to conquer the world in the way that the British have already conquered India, reducing every other nation to the role of a puppet, client, and fall guy for British imperial policy. Lord Palmerston's campaign is not a secret. He has declared it here in the Houses of Parliament, saying that wherever in the world the British subject goes, he can flaunt the laws, secure that the British fleet will support him. Kiwis Romanus sum. Every Briton is a citizen of the new Rome, thundered Lord Palmerston. And with that, the universal empire was proclaimed. During the Napoleonic Wars, the British managed to conquer most of the world outside of Europe, with the exception of the United States. After 1850, the French, be they restored Bourbon, Orleanist, or Bonapartist, are generally pliant tools of London. But in Central and Eastern Europe, there was a Prince Metternich and his Austrian Empire, a very strong land power. There was vast Imperial Russia under the autocrat Nicholas or the reformer Alexander II. There was the Kingdom of Prussia. Lord Palmerston likes to call these the arbitrary powers. Above all, Palmerston hated Metternich, the embodiment and ideologue of the Congress of Vienna system. Metternich presided over one of the most pervasive police states in history. Men said that his rule was shored up by a standing army of soldiers, a sitting army of bureaucrats, a kneeling army of priests, and a creeping army of informers. For Britain to rule the world, the Holy Alliance of Austria, Russia, and Prussia had to be broken up. There is also the matter of the dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire. Starting with Lord Byron's Greek Revolution in the 1820s, British policy has been to play the card of national liberation against each of these rival empires. The imperial theme was sounded in 1846 with the free trade policy. Britain's declaration of intent to loot the world in the name of the pound. Then, in January 1848, Lord Palmerston arranged an insurrection in Sicily 
using British networks that date back to Lord Nelson. That started the great revolutionary year of 1848, and in the course of that year, every government in Europe was toppled, every monarchy badly shaken, at least for a time. Metternich of Austria and King Louis Philippe of France fled to London, where they now spend their time playing cards. There was war in Italy, civil war in Austria, barricades in Paris, and tumult in Germany. The only exception to this rule was Russia, and now Lord Palmerston is preparing to invade Russia with the help of his strategic catamite, Napoleon III, also known as Napoleon le Petit. That will start in about three years, and it will be called the Crimean War. As soon as the war against Russia is over, Palmerston and John Stuart Mill of the British East India Company will start the Great Mutiny in India, which some historians will call the Sepoy Rebellion. Muslim soldiers will be told that the new cartridges issued them are greased with pig fat. Hindu soldiers will be told that they're greased with cow fat, and the result will be what you would expect. But in this conflagration, the British will get rid of the Great Mughal and the Mughal Empire and impose their direct rule on all of India. That's typical John Stuart Mill. He, of course, is the author of On Liberty. The British would like to give China the same treatment they are giving India. Since 1842, Palmerston and the East India Company have been waging war against the Chinese Empire, partly to get them to open their ports to opium to India, and also as a way to conquer China. Already the British have Hong Kong and the other treaty ports. By 1860, the British will be in Beijing, looting and burning the summer palace of the emperor. Shortly after that, the British will back Napoleon in his project of putting a Habsburg archduke on the throne of an ephemeral Mexican empire, the Maximilian Project. These projects will be closely coordinated with Palmerston's plans to eliminate the only two nations still able to oppose him, the Russia of Alexander II and the United States of Abraham Lincoln. Lord Palmerston will be the evil demiurge of the American Civil War, the mastermind of secession, far more important for the Confederacy than Jefferson Davis or Robert E. Lee. And in the midst of that war, Palmerston will detonate a rebellion in Poland against Russian rule, not for the sake of Poland, but for the sake of starting a general European war against Russia. But when the Russian fleets sail into New York and San Francisco, when Lee's wave breaks at Gettysburg, and when the stars and bars are lowered over Vicksburg, the British Empire will be stopped just short of its goal. Just short. And yet, British hegemony will still be great enough to launch the two world wars of the 20th century, and the third conflagration that will begin in 1991. And as we look forward, for a century and a half from 1850, British geopolitics, despite the challenges, despite the defeats, despite the putrefaction of Britain itself, will remain the dominant factor in world affairs. How do they do it? How do the British do it? How can a clique of depraved aristocrats on this tight little island bid to rule the entire world. Don't believe the stories about the workshop of the world. There are some factories here, but Britain lives by looting the colonies. The fleet is formidable, but overrated and very vulnerable to serious challenges. The army, third rate. But the British have learned from the Venetians that the greatest force in history is the force of ideas, and that if you can control culture, you can control the way people think then statesmen, statesmen and fleets and armies will bend to your will. Take our friend Lord Palmerston. Lord Palmerston has the Foreign Office, the Home Office, Whitehall. But when he needed to start the 1848 revolutions, or when the time will come to start the American Civil War, he turns to a troika of agents. These are Lord Palmerston's... These are Lord Palmerston's three stooges. But instead of Moe, Larry, and Curly, these three stooges are named Giuseppe Mazzini, 
Louis Napoleon Bonaparte and David Urquhart. These three stooges, far more than the Union Jack, Victoria, the Bulldog breed, the thin gray line of heroes and the fleet, are the heart of what is called the British Empire. Now, we will get to know Lord Palmerston's three stooges better. But first, one thing must be understood. Mo, Larry, and Curly often worked together on this or that project, but their relations were never exactly classic. I think, I think that will suffice to, I think you will understand their stock in trade was indeed infantile violence. So do not be surprised if, we find, if, we, if we find Lord Palmerston's three stooges lashing out with slanders, knives, and bombs against each other, and even against their august master, Lord Palmerston himself. Twenty minutes to a pound. <laughs> Under Lord Palmerston, England supports all revolutions, except her own. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the leading revolutionary on Her Majesty's Secret Service is Giuseppe Mazzini, our first stooge. Now, Mazzini has concocted a very effective terrorist belief structure. Mazzini is a Genoese admirer of the diabolical Venetian friar, Paolo Tassi. Mazzini's father was a physician to Queen Victoria's father. And for a while, Mazzini worked for the Carbonari, one of Napoleon's Freemasonic fronts. Then, in 1831, Mazzini founded his Young Italy Secret Society. Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, today's president of France, sent him articles for his magazine. Mazzini's cry is, God and the people, Dio e popolo, which means in practice that the people are the new God. Populism becomes a kind of ersatz religion. Mazzini teaches that Christianity developed the human individual, but that the era of Christianity, freedom, human rights, is now over. From now on, the protagonists of history are not individuals anymore, but people understood as racial nationalities. Martini is adamant that there are no inalienable human rights. There is only duty, 
the duty of thought and action to serve the destiny of the racial collectivity. Liberty, says Mazzini, is not the negation of all authority. It is the negation of every authority that fails to represent the collective aim of the nation. There is no individual human soul, only a collective soul. According to Mazzini, the Catholic Church, the papacy, and every other institution which attempts to bring God to man must be abolished. Every national grouping that can be identified must be given independence and self-determination in a centralized dictatorship. In the coming century, Mussolini and the Italian fascists will repeat many of Mazzini's ideas verbatim. Mazzini thinks that each modern nation has a mission. The British would take care of industry and colonies. The Poles, leadership of the Slavic world. The Russians, the civilization of Asia. The French get action. The Germans take care of thought and so forth. For some strange reason, there is no mission for Ireland. And therefore, Mazzini does not support the independence of Ireland. There is, in fact, only one monarchy which Mazzini supports because he says it has deep roots among the people. You guessed it, Queen Victoria. Mazzini preaches an Italian revolution for the Third Rome. After the Rome of the Caesars and the Rome of the Popes comes the Rome of the people. For this, the Pope must be driven out. Mazzini has tried to put this into practice just last year. In November 1848, armed young Italy gangs forced Pope Pius IX to flee from Rome to Naples. From March to June of 1849, Mazzini ruled Rome and the Papal States as one of three dictators, all of them Grand Orient Freemasons. During that time, death squads operated in Rome, Ancona, and other cities. Some churches were sacked and many confessionals were burned. For Easter 1849, Mazzini staged a monstrous mock Eucharist in the Vatican. He called the Novum Pasca, featuring himself, God, and the people. During that time, Mazzini was planning to set up his own Italian national church on the Anglican model. The defense of Rome was organized by Giuseppe Garibaldi, who had joined Mazzini's Young Italy in the early 1830s. But a French army sent by fellow stooge, Louis Napoleon, drove out Mazzini, Garibaldi, and their supporters. Lord Palmerston said that Mazzini's dictatorship in Rome was by far better than any regime the Romans have had for centuries. Right now, Mazzini is here in London, enjoying the support of Lord Ashley, the Earl of Shaftesbury, a Protestant fanatic who also happens to be Lord Palmerston's son-in-law. Mazzini's direct access to the British government payroll comes through James Stansfeld, a junior Lord of the Admiralty and very high official of British intelligence. Last year, Stansfeld provided money for Mazzini's Roman Republic. John Bowring of the Foreign Office is another of Mazzini's patrons. He's the man who will start the second opium war against China. Bowring is also Jeremy Bentham's literary executor. John Stuart Mill of India House is another of Mazzini's friends. Mazzini is close to the proto-fascist writer Thomas Carlyle and has been having an affair with Carlyle's wife. Now, one of Metternich's henchmen once said, that the Palmerston policy is to make Italy turbulent, which is bad for Austria, without making her powerful, which would be a threat to England. Mazzini's role in Italy has been that of a marplot, a saboteur, a wrecker, a terrorist, an assassin. His specialty is to send his brainwashed dupes to their deaths in terrorist attacks. He hides out and always succeeds in saving himself. Mazzini travels readily on the continent using false passports, posing as American, an Englishman, or even a rabbi. In the 30s and 40s, Mazzini was targeting Piedmont in the north and the kingdom of the two Sicilies in southern Italy. In 1848, he rushed to Milan as soon as the Austrians had been driven out and tried to start trouble. One of Mazzini's agents was General Ramorino, and he let the Austrian commander Radetzky outflank the Piedmontese and win the Battle of Novara. Mazzini's man Ramorino was executed for treason, but Piedmont had lost the first war of Italian liberation. The king abdicated, and Mazzini tried to break up Piedmont with a revolt in Genoa. Three years from now, Mazzini will stage an abortive revolt against the Austrians in Milan, mainly to stop Austria from allying with Russia in the Crimean War. A few years after that, Mazzini will try another insurrection in Genova, still trying to break up Piedmont. In 1860, 
Mazzini will encourage Garibaldi to sail to Sicily and then try to provoke a civil war between Garibaldi's dictatorship in southern Italy and Cavour's Piedmontese government in the north. In 1860, Mazzini will be thrown out of Naples as a provo provocateur. By that time, Mazzini will be a hated and reviled figure, but British propaganda and British support will keep him going. Mazzini is also an assassination bureau. In 1848, there was a chance that Pius IX's very capable reforming minister, Pellegrino Rossi, could unify Italy and solve the Roman question in a constructive way <coughs> through an Italian confederation chaired by the Pope, arranged with the help of Gioberti, Cavour, and other Piedmontese. Mazzini's agents, members of Young Italy, stabbed Pellegrino Rossi to death. The killer <coughs> was in touch with Lord Minto, Lord Palmerston's special envoy for Italy. Stooge violence between Mazzini and Napoleon III is always very intense, especially after Napoleon's army finished off Mazzini's Roman Republic. In 1855, a Mazzini agent named Giovanni Pianori will attempt to kill Napoleon III, and a French court will convict Mazzini. Have Napoleon's forces outshone the bungling British in the Crimea? Are the British nervous about Napoleon's new ironclad battleship when they have none? Attempts to kill Napoleon are run by the Tibaldi Fund, run by Mazzini and set up by Sir, Sir James Stansfield of the Admiralty. Later, in February 1858, there will be an attempt by Napo uh, to blow up Napoleon by one of Mazzini's closest and best-known lieutenants from the Roman Republic, Felice Orsini. <coughs> Napoleon will get the message that it is time to get busy and start a war against Austria in 1859. At other times, Mazzini tried to kill King Carlo Alberto of Piedmont. Mazzini's Young Italy is always the party of the dagger, of the stiletto. In the hands of Judith, the sword which cut short the life of Holofernes was holy. Holy was the dagger which Harmodius crowned with roses. Holy was the dagger of Brutus. Holy the poniard of the Sicilian who began the Vespers. Holy was the arrow of Tell. Vintage Mazzini. London's future ability to assassinate men like Walter Rathenau, <coughs> Jürgen Ponto, Aldo Moro, Herrhausen, Rovetter, and others stretches back in unbroken continuity to the Mazzini networks of today. Mazzini is actually doing everything he can to prevent Italian unity. When unity comes 20 years from now, it will come in the form of a highly centralized state dominated by Grand Orient Freemasons. For 30 years, the prime ministers will be at Mazzini's agents, like De Pretis and Christi. Because of the violent liquidation of the papal states, the Catholics will refuse to take part in politics. Italy will remain weak, poor, and divided. After Mussolini, the Italian Republican Party will identify itself with Mazzini, and Ugo Lamalfa and his friends will continue Mazzini's efforts to make sure that Italy is weak and divided, bringing down one government after the other, and ruining the economy. But Mazzini's work for the British extends far beyond Italy. Like the Foreign Office and the Admiralty which he serves, Mazzini encompasses the world. The Mazzini networks offer us a fantastic array of movements and personalities. There are agents, dupes, professional killers, fellow travelers, criminal energy types. Mazzini's Court of Miracles was a public scandal. King Leopold of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha the King of Belgium has been complaining to his niece, Queen Victoria, that in London there is maintained a sort of menagerie of Kossuths, Mazzinis, Lagrange, Les Dreux, Roland, etc., to let loose occasionally on the continent to render its quiet and prosperity impossible. Indeed, on February 21st, 1854, this crew will come together in the home of the American consul, George Sanders. Mazzini, Felice Orsini, Garibaldi, Kossuth, Arnold Ruger, Ledru Rollin, Stanley Wartzell, Alexander Herzen, and the U.S. trader and future president, James Buchanan. There'll also be a Peabody from the counting house. We can think of Mazzini as the zookeeper of a kind of universal 
human zoo. Now, Mazzini's human zoo is divided into theme parks or pavilions, one for each ethnic group. In a normal zoo, there's an elephant house, a monkey house, an alligator pond, and so forth. In Mazzini's zoo, there's an Italian house, a Russian house, a Hungarian house, a Polish house, and an American house. Let's walk through the various theme parks in the zoo and identify some of the specimens. Young Italy, as we've seen, was founded in 1831, attracting the young sailor Giuseppe Garibaldi and Louis Napoleon. Shortly thereafter, there followed Young Poland, whose leaders included the revolutionaries Lelevel and Wurzel. Then came Young Germany, featuring Arno de Uga, who had published some material by an obscure German Red Republican named Karl Marx. This is the Young Germany satirized by Heinrich Heine. In 1834, Mazzini founded Young Europe. Young Europe was billed as the Holy Alliance of the People, opposed to Metternich's Holy Alliance of Despots. By 1835, there was also a Young Switzerland. And in that same year, Mazzini launched Young France. The guiding light here was Le Dour Rollin, who later became interior minister in 1848. There was also Young Corsica, and that was the Mafia. By the end of this century, we will have a Young Argentina founded by Garibaldi, Young Bosnia, Young India, Young Russia, Young Armenia, Young Egypt, the Young Czechs, plus similar movements in Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Greece. Martini is especially interested in creating a South Slavic Federation dominated by Belgrade. And for that reason, he has a Serbian organization. That will have to wait for Martini's student Woodrow Wilson and the Versailles Peace Conference of 1919. Right now, a Masonic group in the United States is gearing up to support the pro-slavery, dough-faced Democrat, Franklin Pierce, for president in 1852. They call themselves Young America. In the future, there will also be the Young Turks. And yes, there is also a palmerston Mazzini front for the Jews, sometimes called Young Israel and sometimes called the Nye Brith. For Mazzini, a nationality means a race a fixed array of behavior like a breed of dog or a species of animal. He's not thinking of a national community united by a literate language and a classical culture to which any person can become assimilated through a political choice. <coughs> For Mazzini, race is unchangeable. Race is destiny. It's a matter of blood and soil. Cats fight dogs. French fight Germans. Germans fight Poles and so on through all eternity. These hatreds are the main datum of sensory perception. Each of Martini's organizations demands immediate national liberation for its own ethnic group on the basis of aggressive chauvinism and expansionism. Martini's war horse is the territorial imperative. They're all obsessed with borders, territory. Each one finds a way to sabotage dirigistic economic development. Each one is eager to submerge and repress the other national groupings in the pursuit of its own mystical destiny. This is Martini's racist gospel of universal ethnic cleansing. Now, we've seen some Italian cages. We also have the Hungarian theme park in the zoo. Our principal specimen here is Louis Kossuth, a leader of the Hungarian Revolution of 1848-1849. Kossuth told the British he was for free trade. He wanted equal status for Hungarians in the Austrian Empire, equal with the Austrians. But within the Hungarian part of the Habsburg Empire, there were other groups, Poles, Ukrainians, Germans, Serbs, Romanians, Croatians, and others. Would they receive political and linguistic autonomy? Kossuth's answer was to ban all official use of Slavic and Romanian languages in favor of Hungarian. Kossuth was therefore on a course for bloody collision with the Illyrian movement for greater Croatia and with the military forces of the Croatian leader Jelacic. There was also a conflict with Serbs, Mazzini had promised the same territory to Hungary, to the Croatians, and to his Serbian South Slav entity. And then there was the question of Transylvania, claimed by the Hungarians, but also by the young Romania of Dimitri Golescu, another Mazzini agent. Young Romania's program was to restore the kingdom of Dacia, it is, as it had existed before the Roman emperor was called the Nye Brith. 
For Mazzini, a nationality means a race, a fixed array of behavior like a breed of dog or a species of animal. He's not thinking of a national community united by a literate language and a classical culture to which any person can become assimilated through a political choice. <coughs> For Mazzini, race is unchangeable. Race is destiny. It's a matter of blood and soil. Cats fight dogs. French fight Germans. Germans fight Poles and so on through all eternity. These hatreds are the main datum of century perception. Each of Mazzini's organizations demands immediate national liberation for its own ethnic group on the basis of aggressive chauvinism and expansionism. Martini's war horse is the territorial imperative. They're all obsessed with borders, territory. Each one finds a way to sabotage dirigistic economic development. Each one is eager to submerge and repress the other national groupings in the pursuit of its own mystical destiny. This is Mazzini's racist gospel of universal ethnic cleansing. Now, we've seen some Italian cages. We also have the Hungarian theme park in the zoo. Our principal specimen here is Louis Kossuth, a leader of the Hungarian Revolution of 1848-1849. Kossuth told the British he was for free trade. He wanted equal status for Hungarians in the Austrian Empire, equal with the Austrians. But within the Hungarian part of the Habsburg Empire, there were other groups, Poles, Ukrainians, Germans, Serbs, Romanians, Croatians, and others. Would they receive political and linguistic autonomy? Kossuth's answer was to ban all official use of Slavic and Romanian languages in favor of Hungarian. Kossuth was therefore on a course for bloody collision with the Illyrian movement for greater Croatia and with the military forces of the Croatian leader Jelacic. It was also a conflict with Serbs. Matini had promised the same territory to Hungary, to the Croatians, and to his Serbian South Slav entity. And then there was the question of Transylvania, claimed by the Hungarians, but also by the young Romania of Dimitrie Golescu, another Mazzini agent. Young Romania's program was to restore the kingdom of Dacia, it is, as it had existed before the Roman Emperor Trajan. So young Hungary and young Romania were pre-programmed to fight to the death over Transylvania, which they did last year. Because of the ceaseless strife of Hungarians, Croatians, Hungarians, Serbians, Romanians, it proved possible for the Habsburgs to save their police state with the help of a Russian army. So we see the ethnic theme houses of the zoo sally forth to fight not just the Habsburgs and the Romanovs, but most of all, each other. And we will find the same thing in viewing the Russian and Polish pavilions. The young Poland of Lelevel and Wurzel demands the recreation of the Polish state and the rollback of the partitions of Poland. But they go much further, claiming borders from the Baltic to the shores of the Black Sea, the Jagiellonian borders. This includes an explicit denial that any Ukrainian nation exists. In the orbit of young Poland is the poet Adam Mickiewicz, a close friend of Mazzini, who was with him last year during the Roman Republic. Mitzkevich argues that Poland is special because it has suffered more than any other nation. Poland is the Christ among nations. Mitzkevich dreams of uniting all of the West and South Slavs against the tyrant of the North, the barbarians of the North. And by that he means Russia, the main target. Young Poland's program also foreshadows an obvious conflict with young Germany over Silesia. Young Russia means the anarchist Mikhail Bakunin and the aristocratic ideologue Alexander Herzen. Herzen is an agent of Baron James Rothschild of Paris. Right after the Crimean War, Herzen will start publishing The Polar Star and The Bell, leak sheets for British secret intelligence that will build up their readership by divulging state secrets. Now Herzen's obvious target is Tsar Alexander II, the ally of Lincoln. Herzen prints the ravings of Bakunin, who preaches pan-Slavism, the idea that Russia will take over all the other Slavic nations. Out of an ocean of blood and fire, they will rise in Moscow high in the sky, the star of the revolution to become the guide of liberated mankind. Vintage Bakunin, vintage Third Rome. If Mazzini relies on the stiletto, for Bakunin it's the peasant's axe 
that will bring down the German regime, as he calls it, in St. Petersburg. So Herzen's role is to sabotage Alexander II and his policy of real anti-British reform in Russia, to block capitalist development. He preaches reliance on the aboriginal Slavic village, the Mir, communal ownership of land, plus the ancient Slavic workshop, the Artel. Now the Mir will never build the Trans-Siberian Railway. Herzen is sometimes called a westernizer, but he is totally hostile to Western civilization. He writes of the need of a new Attila, perhaps Russian, perhaps American, perhaps both, to tear down the old Europe. In the moment when the British will seem so close to winning everything, Herzen will support Palmerston's Polish insurrection of 1863, and he'll lose most of his readers. Once the American Civil War is over, the British will have little use for Herzen. By then, London will be betting on the nihilist terrorists of the Narodnaya Volnya, who will finally kill Alexander II. And London will use the Russian legal Marxist. But today we can see the conflicts between young Poland and young Russia, the national chauvinist operations that are laying the roots for the slaughter of World War I. Now, let us view the cages in the American theme park in Mazzini's Human Zoo. Young America. This name was popularized in 1845 by Edwin de Leon, the son of a Scottish Rite Jewish slave trading family of Charleston, South Carolina. Edwin de Leon will later be one of the leaders of the Confederate Espionage Service in Europe. Young America's leader is George Sanders, the future editor of the Democratic Review. Young America's program of Manifest Destiny is a slave empire in Mexico and the Caribbean. In the 1852 election, Young America will be, will be backing the dark horse Democrat Franklin Pierce against the patriotic Winfield Scott. Scott's Whig party will be destroyed. Young America operatives will receive important diplomatic posts in, in Europe, and there they will support Mazzini and his gang. Mazzini's American contacts are either proto-Confederates or strict abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison. During the American Civil War, Mazzini will favor both the abolition of slavery and the destruction of the Union through secessionism, which is the London line. This subversion will be showcased during the famous tour of Kossuth in the United States, which will happen next year and the year after. Kossuth is going to be accompanied by Mazzini's money bags, the Tuscan Freemason Adriano Lemmi, and on the eve of the Crimean War, with Palmerston doing everything to isolate Russia, Kossuth's line is that the tree of evil and despotism in Europe is, you guessed it, Russia. Kossuth will try to blame even the problems of Italy on Russia. Despite Kossuth's efforts, the United States will emerge as the only power friendly to Russia during the Crimean conflict. Kossuth will call for the United States to join with Russia with England and France in a war against Russia, which is Lord Palmerston's dream scenario. Kossuth will even refuse to call for the abolition of slavery, and he'll get on very well with the slaveholders since he's talking about a U.S. takeover of Cuba, which meshes perfectly with the secessionist program. So Mazzini is the zookeeper for all of these theme parks, but there are other zookeepers and still more theme parks in the human multicultural zoo. The custodians are Palmerston's other two stooges, David Urquhart and Napoleon III. Now there is also a theme park for the British lower orders. The keeper here is the strange and eccentric Scott, David Urquhart, the most aristocratic of Palmerston's stooges. Urquhart was chosen for his work directly by Jeremy Bentham, who praised our David in his letters. Urquhart took part in Lord Byron's Greek Revolution, but he found that he liked Turks better after all. He got a post in the British Empire in Constantinople and went native, becoming an Ottoman Pasha in his lifestyle. His positive contribution to civilization was his popularization of the Turkish bath. But he also kept a harem much of the time. 
Urquhart was also of the opinion that late Ottoman feudalism was a model of what civilization ought to be. Urquhart became convinced that all evil in the world had a single root, Russia, the machinations of the court of St. Petersburg. That's a very convenient view for Lord Palmerston's Britain, which is always on the verge of war or at war with Russia. For Urquhart, the unification of Italy is a Russian plot. He once met Mazzini and concluded after 10 minutes that Mazzini is a Russian agent. That stooge on stooge violence again. Now this Russopobe thinks that the problems of Great Britain are only that Palmerston is a Russian agent and that Palmerston was recruited by one of his many, many mistresses, the Russian Countess Lieven. During the years of Chartist agitation, Urquhart brought up working class leaders and drilled them in the litany that all the problems of the English working man come from Russia via Lord Palmerston. To these workers, Urquhart teaches something that he calls dialectics. Urquhart will be a member of Parliament and controls a weekly newspaper, the Free Press. Now, of course, Palmerston understands that his subversive methods will always generate opposition from the Tory gentry and the Colonel Blimp crowd and the straight-laced crowd. So he has taken the precaution of institutionalizing the opposition under his own control with a raving megalomaniac leader to discredit it. Urquhart's demonization of Russia foreshadows something that will be called McCarthyism about a century from now. Urquhart's remedy is to go back to the simplicity, simplicity of character and merry England in the sense of retrogression to bucolic medieval myth. Quote, the people of England were better clothed and fed when there was no commerce and when there were no factories. Unquote. That is vintage Urquhart. Now, does this talk of pre-capitalist economic formations strike a familiar chord? Does anybody smell a big, fat, commie rat? How interesting that Urquhart should be the controller of British agent Karl Marx, who earns his keep as a writer for Urquhart's paper. David Urquhart is the founder of modern communism. It is Urquhart who will prescribe the plan for Das Kapital. Marx is a professed admirer of Urquhart. He acknowledges Urquhart's influence more than that of any living person. Marx will even compose a life of Lord Palmerston based on Urquhart's wild obsession that old Pam is a British agent, is a Russian agent of influence. This says enough about Marx's acumen as a political analyst. Marx and Urquhart agree that there is no real absolute profit in capitalism and that technological progress causes a falling rate of profit. Another of Urquhart's operatives is a certain Lothar Bücher, confidant of the German labor leader Lassalle, later secretary to the Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck himself. After Gettysburg, Urquhart will move to France and try to open a theme park for right-wing Catholics. He will try to meet Pius IX and will join Cardinal Newman's Oxford movement at the First Vatican Council in 1870. Our third stooge, the current president and soon-to-be emperor of France, Napoleon III. Napoleon le Petit. As we have seen, he started off as a carbonado and terrorist in contact with Mazzini. In 1836, Napoleon tried to parlay his famous name into a successful putsch. He failed and was exiled to America. Then Napoleon was given a private study at the new British Museum reading room and got to know Lord Palmerston. He began work on his book, Les Idées Napoleoniques. The main idea was that the original Napoleon was not wrong to be an imperialist, but only erred in trying to expand his empire at the expense of Great Britain. There's plenty of room for a French empire as a junior partner to the British. The preferred form of government would be democratic Caesarism with frequent plebiscites. Now, in 1848, Napoleon was working for the British as a special constable, a riot cop, to put down an expected Chartist revolution reported by Urquhart. 
There, Napoleon III, when he got to France, used his name to become president. Then he organized a coup d'etat to become emperor. Palmerston quickly endorsed the coup, but that caused hysteria on the part of the Victoria and Albert Palace clique. Palmerston was forced out, but he was soon back stronger than ever. After hundreds of years of warfare, France at last had been broken, placed under a more or less dependable British puppet regime. The Western powers, the Anglo-French, were born. Napoleon III gave Palmerston one indispensable ingredient for his imperial strategy, a powerful land army. Soon an open Anglo-French entente was in full swing. When Victoria came to Paris, it was the first such visit by an English sovereign since Henry VI had been crowned King of France in Notre Dame in 1431. When Napoleon joined Palmerston in attacking Russia in the Crimea, it was the first war in 400 years to see France and England on the same side. Now, Napoleon III is Palmerston's strategic catamite, usually with about as much will of his own as an inflatable sex doll. We can think of him as a blow-up British agent. After the Crimea, Palmerston will need a land army against Austria and northern Italy. Napoleon, egged on by Cavour, who knows how to play the interstices, will oblige in 1859 with the great battle of Solferino. The same with Maximilian's Mexican adventure. During the American Civil War, Napoleon's pro-Confederate stance will be even more aggressive than Palmerston's own. In 1870, Bismarck will defeat Napoleon and send him back to exile in England. Here, Napoleon will plan a comeback, but he will figure that he has to be seen as a man on horseback. Problem is, he has a bladder ailment. The bladder operation designed to make him a man on horseback again will kill him. Napoleon III calls himself a socialist. He will start the latter phase of his regime, the liberal empire. That means France as a theme park in the British Zoo. In 1860, Napoleon will sign a free trade treaty with the British. And on the way, he'll pick up a junior partner colonial empire in Senegal, and he will seize Indochina in 1862, something that will set the stage for a certain war in Vietnam about a century later. Under Napoleon, France will build the Suez Canal and lose it to the British. Napoleon III will furnish the prototype for the fascist dictators of the 20th century. After his defeat, he will bequeath to France a party of proto-fascist colonialists and revanchists beating the drum for Alsace-Lorraine, which Napoleon will lose. These revanchists will turn up in Vichy, the Fourth Republic, and the French Socialist Party of today. And so it will come to pass that Lord Palmerston will attempt to rule the world through the agency of a troika of stooges, each one of them the warden of some pavilion in a human zoo. The reason why must now be confronted. The British Empire exists in the mind of its victims. This is the empire of the senses, the empire of sense certainty, the empire of empiricism. It is the empire of British philosophical radicalism, of utilitarianism, of hedonistic calculus, existentialism, and pragmatism. Why are the British imperialists called the Venetian party? Well, for one thing, they call themselves the Venetian party. The future prime minister, Benjamin Disraeli, Disraeli will write in his novel Coningsby that the Whig aristocrats of 1688 wanted to establish in England a high aristocratic republic on the model of Venice, making kings into doges with a Venetian constitution. During the years after the Council of Florence in 1439, the Venetian enemies of Nicholas of Cusa plotted to wage war on the Italian High Renaissance and Cusa's ecumenical project. To combat Cusa's Renaissance Platonism, the Venetians of the Rialto and Padova turned to a new look Aristotelianism, featuring Aristotle's characteristic outlook, shorn of its medieval and averroistic outgrowths. This was expressed in the work of Pomponazzi, Contarini. During the War of the League of Cambrai, 
An alliance of virtually every power in Europe threatened to wipe out the Venetian oligarchy. The Venetians knew that France or Spain could crush them like so many flies. The Venetians responded by launching the Protestant Reformation with three proto-stooges, or ur-stooges, Luther, Calvin, Henry VIII. At the same time, Contarini and his Jesuits made Aristotle a central component of the Catholic Counter-Reformation and the Council of Trent, and put Dante and Piccolomini on the index of prohibited books. The result was a century and a half of wars of religion, a little dark age culminating in the great crisis of the 17th century. Venice was a cancer, consciously planning its own metastasis. From their lagoon, the Venetians chose a swamp and an island facing the North Atlantic, Holland and the British Isles. Here, the Giovanni party would relocate their family fortunes, their fondi, and their characteristic epistemology. France was colonized too, but the main bets were placed further north. First, Contarini's relative and neighbor Francesco Zorzi was sent to serve as a sex advisor for Henry VIII, whose raging libido would be the key to Venetian hopes. Zorzi brought much with him in his baggage. The Venetian party in England grew under the early stewards as Bacon and his wife, Thomas Hobbes, imported the neo-Aristotelianism of Fra, Fra, Fra Paolo Sarpi, the great Venetian game master of the early 1600s. Now when James and Charles disappointed the Venetians in that 30 years war, Cromwell, Milton, and a menagerie of sectarians were brought to power in an all-Protestant civil war and commonwealth. This was the time of the Irish Genocide, the foundation of the overseas empire in Jamaica. After the depravity of the Restoration, the glorious revolution of 1688 gave birth to the most perfect imitation of the Venetian oligarchical system that the world has ever seen. The great Whig and Tory aristocrats set as their goal a new all-encompassing Roman Empire with its center in London. After the defeat of Leibniz's attempt to save England, Great Britain set off on the path of empire with a new Hanoverian wealth dynasty. It was in the War of the Spanish Succession, 1702 to 1713. This was the first war fought on a world scale and the last gasp for colonial rivals, Spain and Holland. The Peace of Utrecht left the British supreme on the oceans. Louis XIV and Colbert were defeated by divide and conquer Venetian politics and British cash was used to hire Brandenburg and Savoy to fight the French. By winning the coveted Asiento, the monopoly on slave commerce with Spanish America, the British became the biggest slave drivers in the world. The wealth of Bristol and Liverpool would be built on slaves. After some decades of hellfire clubs, there came the War of the Austrian Succession, followed by the Seven Years' War. This was the end of France as a naval power and a worldwide rival for the British. William Pitt, Earl of Chatham, subsidized Frederick the Great of Prussia to win an empire on the plains of Germany. The British took Louisbourg, Quebec, drove the French out of Canada, became paramount in India. And at this point, like their successors in 18, 1989, they were convinced that they could run wild, violating the laws of nature with no penalty, for nothing could now stand against them. But in loading their American colonies with their prohibitions of settlement and manufacture, their Quebec Act, Stamp Act, Townsend Act, Intolerable Acts, they set the stage for the American Revolution. In these years, William Petty, Earl of Shelburne and Marquis of Lansdowne, gathered a stable of ideologues and operatives, his stooges. These were Jeremy Bentham, Adam Smith, Edward Gibbon, founders of British philosophical radicalism. The most primitive form of Aristotle ever devised, there also came a Siamese twin called Free Trade. Shelburne was defeated by Hamilton, Franklin, and Washington, but he did succeed in destroying and destabilizing much of France. By now, British policy was in the hands of Shelburne's student and protege, William Pitt the Younger. After letting the horrors of Bentham's agents brew up for three years, Pitt was able to unite the continental powers against France in the first, second, and third coalitions. Napoleon shattered these coalitions, but his final defeat was the work of Scharnhorst, Gneisenau, and the Prussian reformers, but the beneficiaries were the British. At the Congress of Vienna in 1815, the British were clearly the dominant force, but still obliged to deal with Metternich, Russia, and Prussia. 
But under the regimes of Castlereagh and Canning, the stupidity, greed, and incompetence of Metternich and company made possible the revolutions of 1820, 1825, and 1830. By 1830, Lord Palmerston was ready to take control of the Foreign Office and begin his direct march to undisputed world domination. Metternich was still sitting on the lid of the boiling European cauldron, but Lord Palmerston and his three stooges were stoking the flames underneath. Now, there was a time when the center of oligarchy, usury, and geopolitics in the world was Venice, a group of islands in a lagoon at the top of the Adriatic. In the 16th century, in the wake of the League of Cambrai, Venice was that cancer, planning its own metastasis. These were the years during which a patrician party known as the Giovani, the youngsters, began meeting in a salon called Ridotto Morosini. It is here that the future course of England and Britain was charted. The year is 1509. The League of Cambrai, representing the total combined power of Western Europe, is called upon by the papacy to crush Venice. At the Battle of Agnadello, the Venetian forces are completely destroyed. France is poised to invade the very islands that comprise Venice to deliver the coup de grace. The papacy relents. They fear a war that will be fought on Italian soils by foreign troops. Several times before, such troops had seized part of Italy. In a series of diplomatic maneuvers, the alliance falls apart, and miraculously, Venice is saved. Venice, which worked with the Turks to create a republic of usury and slavery. Venice, whose banking houses of Bardi and Peruzzi brought the Black Death, which depopulated two-thirds of Europe. Venice, the slave traders of Europe, so close to being destroyed, survived. Its survival would now wreak havoc on Western civilization. Modern history commences with Nicholas of Cusa and the Italian Renaissance that Cusa and his collaborators inspired. It was Cusa, with the help of Pius II, that created the basis for a war on the pagan idea of man as a beast and to defend the concept of man as Imago Dei and Kapax Dei. It was the power of these ideas which caused the greatest increase in human population in the history of man. This idea of the power of hypothesis and its relationship to transforming nature proved conclusively that man was fundamentally different from the beast and as such could not be used as a slave. Venice reacted wildly against the ascendancy of this idea. With the papacy and the firm grip of Pius II and Cusa, Venice launches a war to destroy Christianity. The figure of Gasparo Contarini is the key one for Venice in their war. Contarini was trained at Padua University. He was the son of one of the oldest families in Venice. It was said of him that he was so versed in Aristotle that if all of Aristotle was lost, he could reproduce it in its entirety. He learned his Aristotle in Padua under the direction of Pietro Pomponazzi. Every Venetian oligarchical family sent their children to Padua University to become trained as Aristotelians. To understand Venice, you must understand Aristotle. He is pure evil and has been so since the time he wrote his diatribe against the method of Plato approximately 2,300 years ago. Since Aristotle is almost unreadable, you must ask the question, what is it about Aristotle that has made his writing so influential in Western civilization? Aristotle is a thoroughgoing defense of oligarchical society. In his politics, Aristotle is most explicit. His theory of the purpose of politics is to maintain inequality. The state must carry on this natural idea and maintain it. The very basis for Aristotle's politics is the maintenance of the master-slave relationship because it is, as he asserts, most natural. Quote, 
that one should command and another obey is both necessary and expedient. Indeed, some things are so divided right from birth, some to rule, some to be ruled. It is clear then that by nature some are free and others are slaves, and that for these it is both just and expedient that they should serve as slaves. One could accuse me of taking uh, quotes out of context, but this would be false. It is true even Plato makes a case for slavery, but unlike Aristotle, Plato bases his state on the idea of justice. Just compare, compare Aristotle's politics with Plato's Republic, where Plato from the very beginning launches a diatribe against arbitrary power. In the Thrasymachus section of the dialogue, he proves that the very basis for the Republic is a universal idea, that only universal ideas are fundamentally causal. The idea for Plato's Republic, as he shows, must be based on a concept of the good. Since Aristotle is functioning within a philosophical environment created by Plato, he cannot throw out the concept of universals altogether. What he does instead is assign them to the realm of vita contemplativa. Since they are not known by the senses, we can only have faith in their existence. Contrast that to Plato, in which the idea of the good and justice are causal, not contemplative and unknowable. These innate ideas, which in another dialogue by Plato prove, he proves that by showing a slave with these ideas, are the very basis for his republic. It is clear the reason that Aristotle was so widely influential in Venice is that Venice was a slave society based on a principle of oligarchism. Renaissance Christianity is the antithesis of this bestial conception for Venice and Contarini. This Christian idea of man and the rejection of slavery and usury called their very existence into question and they reacted with cold, hard evil in defense of their way of life. This is Gasparo Contarini. Contarini's Aristotelianism was highlighted by his early writings when he asserts, quote, and in truth, I understand that even if I did all the penance I could and more, it would not suffice in the least to merit happiness or even render satisfaction for past sins. Truly, I have arrived at the firm conclusion that nobody can become justified through his own works or cleansed from the desires of his own heart. He also, in another letter, calls man a worm. Radical Protestantism and Contarini's Catholicism are the Aristotelian split between vita contemplativa, faith, and vita activa, works. Aristotelianism is both the hatred of God and man. It is unbelievable that there is no difference between him, Contarini, and Luther. Yet Contarini and several other Venetian noblemen later dominate the Reform Commission which nominally prosecutes a war on the Reformation. This statement by Contarini was the essence of the spirituality movement that, would, uh, that was to dominate a section of the most powerful Venetian oligarchy. Let us look now briefly at Contarini's career to understand how critical he is to Venice. Contarini was Venice's ambassador to the papacy. At another time, he was the ambassador to the court of Charles V. He profiles both Charles V and the papacy. He is next appointed to the Council of Ten, which is the leading body of the Venetian state, and later to the Council of Three, which is the supreme ruling body of Venice. This council is justice in Venice. It ruled on all cases and could order assassinations from which there was no reprieve. This is how Venice kept control of its oligarchical family. What is striking is from the Council of Three, Contarini was appointed a cardinal. As a cardinal, he was first asked to create the Reform Commission for the Council of Trent. 
he and four other spiritualities dominate the commission. He was next appointed to negotiate with the Lutherans at Regensburg at the behest of the Habsburg Emperor Charles V in 1541. At Regensburg, he gives away the Venetian game. Contarini, in what was to be called Article V, reiterates his Lutheran beliefs. It is a bit of an embarrassment that Calvin praises Article V at Regensburg. This is Calvin now. You will marvel when you read Article V that our adversaries have conceded so much. Nothing is to be found in it that does not stand in our own writings. Then, in typical Venetian fashion, Contarini creates an Aristotelian fidious faction inside the church, which insists that the only thing that separates Protestants from Catholics would be now reduced fundamentally to the question of the magisterium. He is later reprimanded by the Pope. It can now be stated what happened to the Renaissance. Venice manipulates both the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, leading to a series of wars which drowns the Renaissance legacy of Cusa and Pius in a sea of blood that culminates in the Thirty Years' War. This war depopulates most of Europe. It sets up the basis for an onslaught against Christianity, much as the cultural pessimism that dominated Europe after World War I. This Venetian evil was now to descend on England. What was Venice's strategic objective? It is now 1520. According to their profile of the Spanish Habsburgs, the major vulnerability of the Habsburgs had been the strategic shipping lanes through the English Channel. Spain needs the Netherlands for massive tax revenue that these holdings brought in order to maintain the Spanish army. The problem was the Spanish were also very much aware of the strategic need to have good relations with England and the Habsburg monarchy married Catherine to Henry VIII to ensure such an alliance. For Venice to succeed, Henry had to be broken from Spain. How was this accomplished and through whom? The Venetian faction in England got the upper hand when Henry VIII fell for the sexual bait of that faction put before him, Anne Boleyn. Anne was the granddaughter of the leader of the Venetian faction in England, Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, of the powerful Howard family. The Howards continued to be agents of Venetian influence for a very long time, and may be still so to this day, even though they were occasionally the victims of it. Other families, such as the Russells, Herberts, the Cavendishes, also put, become consistent carriers of the Venetian virus. Henry's insistence upon the divorce from Catherine of Aragon and the remarriage to Anne entailed the fall of his chief minister, Cardinal Wolsey. Wolsey knew very well what evil Venice represented, and at least on one occasion told the Venetian ambassador to his face. In Wolsey's place emerged a technocrat of the Venetian faction, Thomas Cromwell, who had learned the Venetian system while working in Venice as an accountant to a Venetian well-known, uh, uh, to a Venetian well-known to the leading spirituality, Reginald Pohl. Cromwell effectively ran the English government in the 1530s until his own fall and execution in the 1540s. Cromwell had cultivated those humanists who were favorable to the break with Rome, and a, quote, little Padua came to be developed around one of these figures at Cambridge University by the name of Thomas Smith. Smith returned from Padua to become the head of Cambridge in 1544. He is best, best known for a book on English government which asserts that kings were too powerful. Other leading figures of this little Padua were Rob, Roger Ashke, uh, Ashkem, John Cheek, and William Cecil. This was a tightly knit group. They were the tutors of the Protestant children of Henry VIII, Edward and Elizabeth. At this point, we must add the infamous Francesco Zorzi. Zorzi is a Venetian sex counselor for Henry VIII. It was Zorzi that rendered Venice's official pronouncement that through his reading of the ancient Hebrew text that the Pope did not have the right to grant the dispensation for Henry to marry Catherine. Therefore, according to Venice, Henry never truly married Catherine. For Henry, this sealed the alliance with Venice against Spain 
and unleashed his own ambitions. How explicit the Venetians are on the question of, uh, uh, how, how explicit this faction was on the question of Venice is identified by Thomas Starkey, who was a spirituality who traveled through Venice with Reginald Pohl. Okay. Uh, to identify the importance of Pohl, he is a Plantagenet, who is possibly one of the claimants to the English throne. Pohl later becomes the chief advisor to Mary Tudor, who reigns in England after Henry VIII. Previously, Pohl had also almost been elected Pope. Starkey becomes one of Thomas Cromwell's chief spies. In a fictional dialogue uh, between Thomas Lupset and Reginald Pohl, Starkey states, For this cause, the most wise men considering the nature of princes and the nature of man as it is indeed, affirm a mixed state to be of all others the best and most convenient to conserve the whole out of tyranny. For as in Venice, is no great ambitious desire to be their duke, because he is restrained to order and politic. So with, it, uh, so, it, uh, so with us also should be our king, if his power were tempered after the manner before described. This tightly knit group of Venetian Aristotelians organized Henry's break with Rome. It was this break which opens England for the Venetian operations. The second phase of the Venetian operations were much more devastating. This second phase, phase was launched by the notorious Paolo Sarti. It is in this phase that England's mind and soul are taken, and England is set up to become the bastion of the new age it has become. To understand this, you must understand the mind of Paolo Sarti and who in Venice deploys him. This phase was highlighted by what was understood in Venetian history as the 1580s fight between the Jovani, the young houses, and the Vecchi, the old houses. In this phase, a very radical faction takes over. The Jovani realized that time had run out for the islands of Venice. They were increasingly less viable as a military force. For the Jovani, the only defense of Venice had to be a desperate attempt to destroy the papacy and the Habsburgs by, by securing Germany for the Protestants with the help of France. The Vecchi, it should be understood, wanted to control the papacy and stay within the neutralized Catholic Church, or a neutralized Catholic Church. As we see the Jovani organ organize the Protestant rebellion and want to see the destruction of even the name of Christianity. Further, the plan that evolved was to move part of the money from the massive funds in the vaults of the Church of St. Mark to the Dutch Calvinist Republic Holland and England. For this phase, the takeover of England was left to Paulo Sarpi. Sarpi was nominally a Servite monk who was exceptionally talented, yet he is much more. He is the leading organizer of the Jovani. Out of the Jovani salons and secret society, Venice plans the destruction of Christianity in what was to later to be called Freemasonry. In a book about Sarpy, a modern historian by the curious name Wooten proves that Sarpy was the creator of empiricism and taught Francis Bacon his so-called scientific method. The thesis of this book, which the author proves conclusively, is that Sarpy, while nominally a Catholic monk, revealed himself in his philosophical works to be a radical atheist. Sarpy was to argue that the idea of the need for providential religion as the basis for the majority of men acting morally was unnecessary. He insisted that the belief in God was irrational, since it is not necessary to explain the existence of the physical universe by the act of creation. This is the empiricism of Bacon. It was later revealed by sources that Sarpy was a homosexual and a blasphemer who believed the Bible was just some fantastic stories. He especially attacked the idea that Moses was given the Ten Commandments from God. Since one could be burned for these ideas and beliefs, he never published his philosophical writings. Some of you may be aware of the phrase, the Pope is the Antichrist. It was Paolo Sarpi that created that myth. He is the real founder of modernism and the Enlightenment. With these ideas, 
He creates a pagan cult later called Freemasonry, which dominates England to this day. Out of this salon comes Giordano Bruno, Galileo, which is a complicated case, the creation of the Rosicrucian cult, and the Thirty Years' War. How was this phase done? The story begins by, with an interdict by the Pope against Venice in 1606. This dispute was nominally about two jurisdictional matters, respecting the right of Rome uh, to try two accused prelates and a question of the right to collect money in Venice. Venice retained Paolo Sarpi as their defender. In this fight, Sarpi wrote pamphlet after pamphlet defending of the rights of the state against that of the papacy. Henry Wooten, the ambassador from England to Venice, sent all of Sarpi's writings back to England immediately to be translated. In the course of this fight, Sarpi became the most famous man in Europe. The papacy ended the interdict without achieving its end. In the ensuing days after the interdict was lifted, an assassin tried to kill Sarpi, but he survived. The attempt was laid at the papacy's doorstep, and now Sarpi was a hero in England and throughout Europe. He had faced down the papacy and survived. Sarpi immediately launches a thoroughgoing attack on the very existence of the Church in two works called The History of the Benefices and his most famous work of his career, The History of the Council of Trent. Later this book was dedicated to James I of England and was first published in England. It is ironic that Sarpi organized the radical Protestant opposition throughout Europe, but after all, it is Venice. Sarpi also is introduced by circles around Wooten to Francis Bacon, who corresponds with him. Bacon picks up Sarpi's writings on method from Sarpi's Arte de Ben Pensiere, where he insists that the only way an individual can know anything is through the senses. With this, modern empiricism is launched, which later becomes radical nominalism of Hume. The Jovini very consciously had to build up their own faction among the English nobility. England had to be totally controlled. The drawback that the Jovini had to correct was the fact that England was not really reliable because the king tended to be able to act independently of Venetian strategic considerations. The way the Jovini functioned was by the creation of a Protestant-controlled merchant class. This was the most explicit in the creation of the Venice Company by the Earl of Leicester. Leicester was the founder of the Puritan movement in England. It was he who was granted by Venice certain trading routes. In 1581, another trading company had created the Venetian, with Venetian agreement called the Turkey Company. These two companies later merged to become the Levant Company, which later becomes the infamous British East India Company. The first governor of the East India Company was Thomas Smith, who studied law at Padua. Through this process of creating a merchant class predominantly Puritan, Venice also creates a battering ram against the king. These radical Protestant cults take over England during the so-called Commonwealth period. While England takes some 80 more years to complete the Venetian takeover, the empire of the mind is ensconced in England irreparably. Sarpi and Venice create the Rosicrucian cult of syncretic religion that becomes Freemasonry. Once that process of takeover is complete, England becomes the bastion of paganism, usury, and slavery. In short, Aristotelian. This hatred of Imago Dei is the basis of England's promotion of the New Age. This was Sarpi's program and intention. This completes the essential destruction of the English soul. Venice and Venetian methods had transplanted themselves in England. The consolidation of the Venetian party in England and later in Britain was above all a question of culture. Francesco Giorgi, the Kabbalist, Rosicrucian sex advisor we've heard of, came to London to deliver his opinion in 1529, and he remained at the court for the rest of his life, building up an important party of followers, the nucleus of the modern Venetian party in England. Georgie wrote books about Kabbalistic Sephiroth to expound a mystical, irrationalist outlook and to undercut the influence of Nicholas Cusanus. Another book, 
assures the aspiring wizard or magician that Christian angels will guard him to make sure that he does not fall into the hands of demons. Francesco Giorgi was a great influence on certain Elizabethan poets. Sir Philip Sidney was a follower of Giorgi, as was the immensely popular Edmund Spencer, the author of the long narrative poem, The Fairy Queen. Spencer is a key source for the idea of English imperial destiny as God's chosen people with broad early hints of British Israel. Marlowe and Shakespeare both attacked Georgie's influence in plays like Dr. Faustus and Othello, but the Venetian school was carried on by the Rosicrucian Robert Flood and, of course, by Bacon and Hobbes. John Milton, the admirer of Paolo Sarpi, an apologist for usury, is an example of the pro-Venetian Puritan of the Cromwell Commonwealth period. Milton taught that the Son of God is inferior to the Father, a kind of afterthought, and in any case, not necessary. Milton was the contemporary of Sabbatai Zevi, the false messiah from Smyrna, Turkey, whose father was an agent for English Puritan merchants. Did Milton's Paradise Regained of 17, 1671 reflect knowledge of Sabbatai Zevi's meteoric career, which burst on the world in 1665? The British East India Company was founded in 1600, and by 1672, adventurers like Diamond Pitt were freebooting around India. In December 1688, the armies of the Dutch Prince William of Orange invaded England. Interrupting the Hobbesian nightmare, the country had experienced under the deranged King Charles II and his brother James II. A worse nightmare, nightmare was to follow when William seized the throne of James II, for he embodied a more highly distilled form of poison <clears throat> which Venice had perfected during its sway over the remains of the Dutch Republic. This outright usurpation is blithely referred to in British Venetian parlance as the Glorious Revolution, which should give you some idea of how little regard for truth prevails in these circles. The notion of English rights and liberties was quickly transformed from fiction to fraud under William's dictatorial regime. When King James II fled to France, the rightful successor to the English throne was his eldest daughter Mary, who had married William of Orange. Reluctantly, he was a notorious homosexual. William's demand to be declared king was never submitted to Parliament for a constitutional veneer. Instead, he summoned a special convention, which granted him full power rather than simply the rank of the Queen's consort. King William's Venetian baggage included the evil John Locke, who became the chief propagandist for foisting the Bank of England on that hapless country in 1694. This was not the sort of bank you turned to for financial assistance. It was a gargantuan Venetian swindle, which promptly created England's first national debt to finance ongoing wars of attrition in Europe, imposed a credit crunch by cutting the amount of circulating English coinage nearly in half and loaded new taxes on an already collapsing economy. The bank's chief architect was Venetian party leader Charles Montagu, William's new Chancellor of the Exchequer, who later attained the loftier position of British Ambassador to Venice. Montagu appointed the pathetic Sir Isaac Newton to oversee the recoinage swindle and Newton repaid that debt by prostituting his own niece to serve as Montague's mistress. The bank's promotional hireling, John Locke, is better known as the peddler of the obscene notion that the human mind is nothing more than a tabula rasa, a passive register of animal sensations. He clearly had a higher regard for the cash register 
and openly defended usury as a necessary service for those whose estates lie in money. Locke's theories of government approximate those of a casino operator who lays down rules rigged for the house under which the bestialized players compete for sums of money which then define their worth as individuals. This is Locke's liberty to pursue property. His notion of the social contract, which guarantees the players' club members the right to enter the casino, was in fact advanced to justify William of Orange's usurping the throne. James II, in effect, was charged with having denied those rights to his more speculative subjects, thus breaking the contract. Locke argued that the Venetian mob was therefore entitled to move in under a new one. By 1697, the Venetian party's coup inside England was nearly total, and its members filled William's ship of state from stem to stern. They looked forward to reducing a most troubling matter in the English colonies of America, the impulse toward building an independent nation which had driven the Venetians berserk since the 1630s founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. In 1701, John Locke, as a member of England's Board of Trade, advocated, advocated revoking all the independent charters of the American colonies, placing their economic activity under royal dictatorship, and banning their manufacture of any finished goods. Yet even as the Venetians were swaggering over their apparent triumph, a powerful Republican opposition was building around a higher conception of the nature and purpose of man, which both inspired and opened the way for the later founding of the United States. Its leader was the great German scientist and statesman Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, who led what might well be called a movement for the pursuit of happiness, the ultimate goal of the liberty America embraced in its Declaration of Independence. In the face of the new Venetian onslaught in England, Leibniz set forth his view of human happiness from the standpoint of man's creation in Imago Dei. Writing on the notions of right and justice in 1693, Leibniz defines charity as universal benevolence, which he calls the habit of loving which is to regard another's happiness as one's own. That joy is first approximated, he says, in the contemplation of a beautiful painting by Raphael, for example, by one who understands it, even if it brings no riches in such a way that it is kept before his eyes and regarded with delight as a symbol of love. When the object of delight is at the same time also capable of happiness. His affection passes over into true love, Leibniz says. But the divine love surpasses other loves because God can be loved with the greatest result. Since nothing is at once happier than God and nothing more beautiful and more worthy of happiness can be known than he. And as God possesses the ultimate wisdom, Leibniz says, the notions of men are best satisfied if we say that wisdom is nothing else than the very science of happiness. As the leading scientist and philosopher of his day, Leibniz was widely known throughout Europe and among such Republican leaders of New England as the Winthrops and the Mathers, later extending to include most significantly Benjamin Franklin. From the 1690s onward, Leibniz's leading ally within England, Scotland, and Ireland was the brilliant anti-Venetian polemicist Jonathan Swift, who directed a cultural onslaught against the bestial notions of Bacon, Hobbes, Descartes, Newton, and Locke for more than 40 years. From the standpoint of reason, the, the Aristotelian empiricism of the likes of Descartes and Locke reduces the notion of man to the level of a mere beast, 
which of course is the prerequisite for imposing an empire of the sort the Venetians sought then and now. When Jonathan Swift took up his cudgels on behalf of Leibniz's refutation of empiricism, he ridiculed their enemies' ideas for what they were, insane. Swift's A Digression on Madness in his 1696 work, A Tale of a Tub, examines the great introducers of new schemes in philosophy, both ancient and modern. They were usually mistaken by all but their own followers, Swift says, to have been persons crazed or out of their wits, agreeing for the most part in their several models with their present undoubted successors in the Academy of Modern Bedlam. By 1701, the lunatics of the late model incarnation of the Venetian party had typically inbred a set of oligarchical families mixing and matching Spencers and Godolphins and Churchills, the last headed by John Churchill, soon to become Duke of Marlborough. <laughs> Churchill had begun as a page boy to Charles II in 1665 behind the skirts of his sister Arabella, the mistress of the, of the king's brother James. Then for similar services rendered, Churchill received 10,000 pounds from Charles II's favorite mistress. With things apparently moving so swimmingly, the Venetians set their course for the next major objective, the destruction of France, the most productive economic power in Europe. Under the ministry of Jean-Baptiste Colbert, the patron of the Scientific Academy at Paris, where Leibniz himself was engaged in the early 1670s, France had led the way in infrastructural and industrial development. So, in 1701, England launched war on France. More than a decade of bloodshed and destruction followed for the populations of both countries and their European allies. It was yet another rigged game in which Venice expected to be the only winner. There are inevitably loose ends in any foul scheme. Queen Mary had died in 1694 leaving William without a direct heir. Her sister Anne was next in line to the throne, but the death of Anne's only surviving child in 1700 presented a new succession crisis. An act of settlement was imposed in 1701. James I's 71-year-old granddaughter, Sophia, the head of the German House of Hanover, was designated as Anne's successor. King William died in 1702, and Anne became Queen of England. As the Venetian party expected, she quickly bestowed preeminence at court upon the Duke and Duchess of Marlborough, who had spun their webs of influence over her for many years. The problem for the Venetians was that Sophia's chief advisor and privy counselor was Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz. With Leibniz virtually a step away from guiding policy in London, the final battle against Venetian party dictatorship within England broke out in earnest. It was a conflict between the pursuit of happiness and the lust for empire. The Marlboroughs resorted to deceit, terror, and treachery to cut off political relations or even ordinary civilities between Queen Anne and Sophie of Hanover. Swift maintained a fierce barrage, both publicly and privately, against Marlborough's Venetian gang, to the point that he broke their domination of Queen Anne's cabinet, extended his own influence to her innermost circle, and during 1710 and 1711, drove the Marlboroughs and all their cronies from office. London desperately hurled Isaac Newton, that's desperate, into the fray against life. <laughs> puffing the old fraud up with the lie that differential calculus was his invention rather than Leibniz's. Leibniz and Swift conspired to bring the great composer George Friedrich Handel from Hanover to London in 1710, seeking to uplift English musical culture from decadent braying and outright snoring. 
And in the midst of all this, Swift managed to get two of his allies appointed to royal governorships in the American colonies. Robert Hunter in New York and Alexander Spotswood in Virginia launched a drive in 1710 which opened the door to our future continental republic. That same year in Massachusetts, Cotton Mather published his Republican organizing manual, an essay upon the good, which spread Leibniz's notion of the science of happiness throughout America for more than a century. Benjamin Franklin paid tribute to Mather's work as the single most important influence upon his life. Jonathan Swift said of this period that he doubted there was another in history more full of passages which the curious of another age would be glad to know the secret springs of. The Venetians would not, would not like you to know that Leibniz and Swift constructed some of the secret passages which led to the founding of the American Republic. But within Britain, as it, became, as it came to be known after the 1707 Union which England forced upon Scotland, the battle against the Venetian party was soon lost. Leibniz's patron, Sophie of Hanover, the designated successor to Queen Anne, died in May 1714 at the age of 84. Her son George was now the heir to the British throne. William of Orange had been George's idol, and Marlborough and the Venetian party had bought him many times over. Barely two months after Sophie's death, Queen Anne's life was ended probably by poison, at the age of 49. The Duke of Marlborough, who had plotted in exile for years for Anne's overthrow, landed in England the same day. And George of Hanover was proclaimed Great Britain's King George I. Jonathan Swift had been forced to flee to Ireland, and George soon dismissed Leibniz from the court of Hanover. How serious was the threat? Leibniz and Swift posed to the Venetian party's conspirators. Just consider their, sat their satanic rage against the dead Queen Anne, who for all her faults had learned to seek something better in life than they could ever know. There was no public mourning, nor royal funeral. Her corpse was left to rot for more than three weeks. Then a chosen few serving George I buried her secretly at night in Westminster Abbey, beneath the tomb of her great-great-grandmother, Mary, Queen of Scots. To this day, no stone or tablet marks her grave. Leibniz himself died in 1716. Jonathan Swift fought on from Ireland, from the position Queen Anne had granted him as the dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. He became the acknowledged political leader of all Ireland during the 1720s, building a mass-based movement on the principles of man's God-given right to liberty and the right to national sovereignty based on natural law. Swift thereby extended Leibniz's movement for the pursuit of happiness and immeasurably influenced the growth of republicanism in 18th century America. Britain, however, began a rapid descent into hell under the new regime of George I. Previously secret Satan-worshipping societies such as the Hellfire Club now surfaced, heralded by the publication of Bernard Mandeville's Fable of the, of the Bees, or Private Vices, Public Benefits, in 1714. Very simply, Mandeville argued that the interests of the state were nothing more than the maximum fulfillment of its individual's hedonistic pleasures. The more private vices, the more public benefits. Therefore, the state thrives most upon the corruption of its subjects. Inevitably, Britain was soon locked into a Venetian orgy of corruption and new heights of financial speculation, leading to the massive blowout of the South Sea bubble in 1720. Appropriately, the government which emerged in 1721 from this devastating collapse was headed by Prime Minister Robert Walpole, who held that post in the service of evil for the next 20 years. 
The Hellfire Clubs not only proliferated, they became the inner sanctum of Britain's degenerate elite. The most prominent one, founded in 1720 by Lord Wharton, included on its dining room menu Hellfire Punch, Holy Ghost Pie, Devil's Loins, and Breast of Venus, a piece of meat garnished with cherries for nipples. By the 1760s, when the American colonies began to openly break with Britain, most of the king's cabinet were members of the Hellfire Club. When Benjamin Franklin served as our colonial postmaster general, for example, his official superior, Sir Francis Dashwood, was the head of the Hellfire Club. The murderous toll of such a regime upon the British population is expressed very simply by the following statistics. From 1738, to 1758, there were only 297,000 births recorded against 486,000 deaths. Typifying the bestiality of the emerging British Empire was the phrase smugly coined by Robert Walpole, every man has his price. We must not pay it. British empiricism started from Bacon's inductive method based on sense certainty, taken from the Venetians. Then came Locke. Locke was followed by the solipsist Barclay, who denied any basis in reality for our sense impressions. They're a kind of videotape played in each one of our heads by some unknown supernatural agency. Perception was the only existence there was. Then came the Scots lawyer and diplomat David Hume. For Hume also, there is really no human self, but only a bundle of changing perceptions. In his early works, Hume attacked the idea of cause and effect. For Hume, there is no necessary connection between a cause and an effect that the human mind can know with certainty. We only have some vague association or habit of thought but as far as we know, one phenomenon has usually been followed by another. But in these same earlier works, Hume had at least accepted the importance of filling the tabula rasa of each new human mind with a stock of received ideas, of conduct, which can be lumped under the heading of custom. During Hume's later years, the power of the Shelburne faction became dominant in Britain. British liberal empiricism tends to be several degrees more rotten than its continental European counterparts. In October of 1776, a 28-year-old Eng English barrister named Jeremy Bentham wrote contemptuously of the Declaration of Independence, which had been signed as an act of the Continental Congress on July 4th of that year. This, he spewed, they hold to be a truth self-evident. At the same time, to secure these rights, they are satisfied that government should be instituted. They see not that nothing that was ever called government ever was or ever could be exercised but at the expense of one or another of those rights that some one or other of those pretended unalienable rights is alienated. In these tenets they have outdone the extravagance of all former fanatics. Shortly after penning this venom, Bentham made his philosophical breach with the American Republicans all the more clear in a lengthy tract titled An Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation, published in 1780. That manuscript would not only prescribe the founding principles of British philosophical radicalism, 
it would propel Bentham into the very center of a then emerging new British Foreign Office and British Foreign Intelligence Service, consolidated under the guiding hand of William Petty, Lord Shelburne, a man who at the time was de facto, if not de jure, Doge of Britain. Bentham categorically rejected any distinction between man and the lower beasts, defining man instead as a creature driven purely by hedonistic impulse, to which he wrote, quote, Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do as well as to determine what we shall do. Every effort we make to throw off our subjection will serve but to demonstrate and confirm it. The principle of utility, the greatest happiness or greatest felicity principle, recognizes this subjection and assumes it for the foundation. Systems which attempt to question it deal in caprice instead of reason, in darkness instead of light. So taken with Bentham was Lord Shelburne that he installed the writer who fancied himself alternately as literally the reincarnation of Sir Francis Bacon and as the Sir Isaac Newton of the moral sciences in an apartment at his Bowood estate. Shelburne assigned to Bentham an English and Swift Swiss editor to ensure the widest dissemination of Bentham's works in both the English and French-speaking worlds. Later, Bentham's works would even be more widely circulated throughout Latin America during his years of intimate collaboration with the American traitor and assassin of Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, and with revolutionist General Francisco de Miranda, a Venezuelan by birth who played a leading role as a paid agent of the British East India Company in the Jacobin Terror in France, and Simon Bolivar. Aaron Burr, fleeing the United States, took up residence at the home of Bentham in London, and the two men conspired on a number of occasions to establish an empire first in Mexico and later in Venezuela. At the very moment of his taking up with Bentham, Lord Shelburne was in the process of launching his most daring political intrigues. In June of 1780, weary of the failed prosecution of the war in North America, and convinced that the ministry of Lord George North would bring eternal ruin to his dreams of permanent empire, Lord Shelburne, through the East India Company and its allied Bering Bank, bankrolled a Jacobin mob to descend on London, ostensibly in protest over the granting of Irish reforms. The so-called Irish reforms amounted to little more than the forced conscription of Irishmen to fight in the British Army in North America, a move that Shelburne hoped would also defeat the pro-American Republican movement inside Ireland that had nearly launched its own successful Republican revolt against Britain in 1779. Led by Lord George Gordon, the Protestant rabble stormed Westminster, sending parliamentarians and lords alike down flights of stairs, out windows, and to the hospitals. For eight days, London was ransacked, culminating in the storming of the Newgate prison and the freeing of all of the prisoners who joined in the assault on the parliament. Lord Shelburne, as head of the Interior Committee of the House of Lords, personally assured the maximum terror by delaying the reading of the riot act which called out the home guard until violence had spread to every corner of the city. When the flames died, the ministry of Lord North was in ashes as well. North resigned as prime minister and within months, Shelburne was himself in the new Rockingham cabinet as foreign secretary for the Northern District, subsuming the North American colonies. From that post, he would be the principal negotiator directing the British team in Paris, sitting across the table from Benjamin Franklin. By this time also, King George III 
had declared himself wholly subservient to the Shelburne-led East India Company faction, the Venetian party. As the result of these events, the shadow government formally took charge of the official state apparatus. The intelligence operations formerly housed at the East India Company were henceforth run out of the Foreign Ministry and the British Secret Intelligence Services. A postscript on Lord Gordon, Shelburne's agent provocateur. After a brief stay in the Tower of London, foreshortened by Shelburne's personal intervention with the Crown, Lord Gordon made off to friendlier grounds in the Netherlands, where, to the astonishment of his Scottish Presbyterian cronies, he became a convert to Jewish Kabbalism, taking the name Israel Bar Abraham. Shortly thereafter, he surfaced in Paris as an occult advisor to Marie Antoinette, and from that position participated in Shelburne's intrigues against the French Bourbons. The Jacobin insurrection in Paris, during 1791 to 1793 was a replay on grander scale of the earlier Shelburne instigated Gordon riots down to the storming of the Bastille prison and the unleashing of the criminals. Lord Shelburne, as foreign minister, took the position that the former colonies in North America must be once again brought under the British yoke but not through the deployment of military might or through claims of property title. For Shelburne, the battle cry of the new Venice, new Rome, was free trade. As early as 1763, in a famous carriage ride from Edinburgh to London, Shelburne had commissioned two works from one of his East India Company scribblers, a man named Adam Smith. First, he commissioned Smith to prepare the research outlines for the study that would be later completed by another India House propagandist, Edward Gibbon, on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, a study critical to Shelburne's commitment to establish a new third Roman Empire headquartered in London. In addition, he ordered the preparation of an apologia for free trade, which Smith completed himself in 1776 under the title, The Wealth of Nations. In 1787, Shelburne's leading intelligence agent, Jeremy Bentham, went one better than Smith by publishing a series of letters from Russia that were assembled in a pamphlet titled, In Defense of Usury. The final letter, addressed to Smith himself, chastised the India House economist for not going far enough in his embrace of unbridled monetary dictatorship. Bentham demanded an end to all restrictions on usurious interest rates, employing the liberal argument that suppression of usury stifled invention. Smith immediately wrote of Bentham's in defense of usury, quote, the work is one of a superior man. Shelburne's own most eloquent plea for unbridled free trade and usury came during his brief tenure as Prime Minister from 1782 to 1783. Although he had formerly preferred to steer British politics from behind the scenes in his capacity as the chairman of the three-man secret committee directing the East India Company, Shelburne felt compelled to briefly take the formal reins of government to ensure the launching of his new British Imperium. On January 27, 1783, Shelburne stood before the House of Lords to argue for ratification of the Treaty of Paris, formally bringing to an end the American Revolution and the conflict with France and Spain. Quote, you have given America with whom every call under the heaven urges you to stand on the footing of brethren, a share in a trade, the monopoly of which you sordidly preserve to yourselves. Monopolies, some way or other, are very justly punished. They forbid rivalry, and rivalry is of the very essence of well-being of trade. 
I avow that monopoly is always unwise. But if there is any nation under heaven which ought to be the first to reject monopoly, it is the English. Situated as we are between the old world and the new, and between southern and northern Europe, all we ought to covet on earth is free trade. With more industry, with more capital, with more enterprise than any trading nation on earth, it ought to be our constant cry. Let every market be open. Shelburne's policy of unbridled free trade war between Britain against the United States nearly destroyed the American Republic at birth. Fortunately, some of America's founding fathers clearly and unambiguously understood the danger of Shelburne's free trade ruse. They launched a crucial debate over the need for a strong federal constitution. But for the Federalist debate and the resulting United States Constitution of 1789, Shelburne's scheme for the rapid bankrupting and reabsorbing of North America into the British Imperium would have likely succeeded. Alexander Hamilton was blunt in his Federalist Paper No. 11, published in November 1787, quote, The adventurous spirit of America has already excited uneasy sensations in several of the maritime powers of Europe. If we could unite and can continue united, we may counteract a policy so unfriendly to our prosperity in a variety of ways. Suppose, for instance, we had a government in America capable of excluding Great Britain from all of our ports. What would be the probable operation of this step upon her politics? Would it not enable us to negotiate with the fairest prospect of success for commercial privileges of the most valuable and extensive kind in the domain of that kingdom? Even with these pressing matters still unresolved in North America, Shelburne and Bentham turned their attention to another critical front directly across the English Channel in France. The Seven Years' War of 1756 to 1763 had stripped France of its once formidable maritime capacity. Shelburne now sought to destroy France as an economic and military rival on the continent as well. From the outset, the Jacobin Terror was a British East India Company, British Foreign Office orchestrated affair. The bloody massacre of France's scientific elite was systematically carried out, although by French hands, manning French guillotines, by the guiding hand from London. Jacques Necker, a Geneva-born Protestant, slavishly pro-British banker, had been installed through the efforts of Shelburne's leading ally in France, Philippe, the Duke of Orléans, as finance minister. Necker's daughter, the infamous Madame de Stael, would later run one of Shelburne's most important Parisian salons. Although Necker had failed in repeated efforts to block France from allying with the Americans during the American Revolution, he did succeed in presiding over the depletion of the French treasury and the collapse of the French credit system, greatly aided by the free trade agreements between England and France. Economic crisis across France was the precondition for political chaos and insurrection. And Shelburne readied the projected destabilization by creating what he himself called the radical writer's shop at, at his Bowwood estate, staffed by Jeremy Bentham, the Genevan Antion Dumont, and the Englishman Samuel Romilly. Speeches were prepared by Bentham translated and transported by diplomatic pouch and other means to Paris, where leaders of the Jacobin terror, Marat, Danton, Robespierre, delivered the fiery oratories. Records of East India Company payments to these leading Jacobins are still on file to this day at the British Museum. So taken up with the events in France was Bentham, 
that on the 25th of November, 1791, he wrote to National Assemblyman J.P. Garon, offering to move to Paris to take charge of the penal system. In closing a draft of his Panopticon proposal, Bentham wrote, quote, Allow me to construct a prison on this model. I will be the gowler. You will see by the memoir, this gowler will have no salary, will cost nothing to the nation. The more I reflect, the more it appears to me that the execution of the project should be in the hands of the inventor. At the same time, he was proposing to assume the post of chief gowler of the Jacobin Terror, which sent many of France's greatest scientists and the majority of pro-American Republicans to the guillotines or the prisons, Bentham made no bones about his loyalties. In accepting the honorary title of Citizen of France, Bentham wrote to the Jacobin Interior Minister in October 1792, quote, I should think myself a weak reasoner and a bad citizen were I not though a royalist in London, a Republican in Paris. Bentham's Panopticon scheme was literally a slave labor camp, first designed when he was visiting his brother, a Shelburne spy in Russia, in 1787. Asked by Prince Potemkin, the minister of Catherine the Great, to help procure a steam engine to build up Russian industry, Bentham argued that human labor, not steam power, ought to be sufficient. His design, complete with elaborate architectural drawings, called for criminals, the indigent and the retarded, along with their children, to be placed in jail cells equipped with primitive machinery, run by a central power source, which in turn was fueled by swings, merry-go-rounds, and seesaws in the children's own cell block. The energy expended by the children playing on the toys would drive the factory. A central guard room affixed with two-way mirrors would permit one guard to oversee the slave labor of hundreds of inmates. Above the main door of the Panopticon was to be a sign reading, quote, had they been industrious when free, they need not have drudged here like slaves. During his tour of Russia and the Ottoman Empire, when he devised his Panopticon scheme and wrote in defense of usury, Bentham had also written in his personal diary, it is an old maxim of mine that interest as love should be free. It is therefore of little shock that we find Bentham also writing in 1785 an essay on the subject of pederasty, arguing against any sanctions against homosexuality, lesbianism, masturbation, and bestiality. Bentham dismissed the harsh penalties then in force against pederasty as the result of irrational religious fears born of the Old Testament destruction of Sodom and perpetuated by society's, quote, irrational antipathy to pleasure in general and sexual pleasure in particular. Christian morality, like every other expression of natural law, had no place in Bentham's world of pleasure and pain. In the wake of the initial success, in bringing France to its knees via the brutal Jacobin terror. Bentham sponsored several generations of philosophical radicals, from his closest protégés, James Mill and Sir John Bowering, to James Mill's son, John Stuart Mill, Thomas Carlyle, and David Urquhart. Carlyle, under the watchful eye of John Stuart Mill, penned the official British history of the French Revolution, Needless to say, burying the role of Shelburne, Bentham, and their entire cabal in that horrific event. Bowering, Bentham's long-suffering personal secretary, would supervise the publication of Bentham's collected works in an 11-volume series, 
would serve as Lord Palmerston's agent handler of the notorious Giuseppe Mazzini and would instigate the second opium war against China from his post as em emissary in Canton. Urquhart, one of the youngest of the Benthamites, would play the role of agent handler for Karl Marx. Upon his death in 1832, Bentham's body was dissected and stuffed, his head cast in bronze and placed at his feet, with a mask affixed in its place. For years, the mummified Bentham, seated in his favorite chair inside a glass case, was an ever-present participant in all of the meetings of his radical circle. To this day, the mummy enjoys a place of prominence at London University. of Tsar Alexander II with two Russian fleets being sent to American ports in 1863 with orders from the Tsar to join Lincoln in fighting against Britain and France should general war break out. Mazzini, Urquhart, and their assets will pull out all the stops to isolate Russia and blow up Eastern Europe. In the midst of these preparations, we have the emergence of young Israel, Benai Brit, as an ideal British weapon against both the United States and Russia, and also against other nations. Lord Palmerston's enthusiasm for Zionism was stimulated during the Middle East crisis of 1840, when France backed a rebellious satrap of the Ottoman Sultan. The British found that while the French were the official protectors of the Roman Catholics in the Turkish Empire and the Russians were the patrons of the Orthodox, the British had no group of Anglicans or Puritans to sponsor. The British turned their attention to Armenians and Jews. Palmerston ordered British diplomats to take Jewish communities under their protection. Lord Palmerston discovered that Britain was the natural guardian of the Jews. This gave the British a foot in the door in the Middle East and also in Russia, including Russian Poland, where one half of world Jewry then resided. At this time, Palmerston's son-in-law, the Earl of Shaftesbury, wrote, It may be safely asserted that the Jews contemplate a restoration to the soil of Palestine. Shaftesbury was talking through his hat. He admitted in his own report that many Jews would actually prefer a seat in the House of Commons in England to a seat under the vines and fig trees of Palestine. But the British resolve to force Jews to settle in Palestine was clear. The founder of Zionism in its modern British-sponsored form is not Theodore Herzl, as some say, but a certain Moses Hess. Hess is the man who converted Friedrich Engels to communism. Hess wrote parts of Marx's German ideology. In 1861, Hess will write, Rome and Jerusalem, which attacks the great Moses Mendelssohn for the idea that Judaism is a religion and a culture. For Hess, Judaism is a race in the blood and soil sense of Mazzini. So now yet another of Palmerston's theme parks will open its doors. In the, in the Bidet Brief, official authorized history, it says, Bidet Brief's relationship to the Civil War presents something of a mystery. They say that the arrest 
of the B'nai B'rith's leader in Washington as a Confederate spymaster was unfair. They say that no one can account for why the group was not pro-union when most Jews were pro-union and B'nai B'rith's lodges were almost all in the north. Indeed, Jewish soldiers in the Union Army were intensely proud, mostly German immigrant anti-slavery Republicans. To solve the mystery, we go back 20 years before the start of the American Civil War. British Foreign Minister Palmerston launched Zionism in 1840. He wrote that the Jews desired to return to Palestine. Abba Iban points out that the Jews knew nothing about this. And a month later, the British landed troops in Palestine for the first time. The Nabrith was started officially in 1843 by some obscure Freemasons in New York. To be a secret society like Freemasonry for Jews. B'nai B'rith was to shape and lead a particular political faction with a particular agenda within the Jewish community. The agenda for this project came out in a famous speech given two years later at South Carolina College. The speaker was Edwin de Leon from a Jewish family in South Carolina that was already notorious for its involvement in the slave trade and in Scottish Rite Freemasonry. De Leon was later a leader of the Confederate Secret Service. De Leon praised his teacher at the school, Thomas Cooper, an English atheist and Lord Shelburne's adventurer who had first proposed that the South should secede from the Union. De Leon hailed Cooper as a tender-hearted religious heretic and an earnest disciple of the school of Bentham and Malthus. De Leon said, There is a young Germany, a young France, and a young England, and why not a young America? He told the students, Any great civil convulsion comes from a source that is unexpected and obscure. In the French Revolution, he said, the priests and nobles were only the flax with which the flame was kindled, but those who first applied the spark were the filthy, obscure savants of the Enlightenment. De Leon reminded the students that the actors in that drama were only its creatures, not its creators. He then proposed revolutionary military action as the idea for his young America to spread what he called freedom by force. The young America idea first bore its bitter fruit when U.S. President James Polk ordered American troops to invade Mexico. Young Congressman Abraham Lincoln exposed the president as a fraud, and Lincoln denounced the Mexican War as a slave owner's conspiracy that would wreck our country. Lincoln was driven out of politics until 12 years later. This British project matured in the middle 1850s, and its active focus shifted to the West, there were two important partners out there. Isaac M. Wise, B'nai B'rith Midwest leader based in Cincinnati, and Killian H. Van Rensselaer, a British military operative and Scottish Rite Mason Northern leader also based in Cincinnati. Between 1854 and 1860, they spread a pro-slavery, secessionist, terrorist group along this route, the Knights of the Golden Circle. 
Wise's B'nai B'rith organization spread southward along the identical route. Their plan was to spread slavery into Latin America and the U.S. West and to break up the USA into several small countries. In Louisiana, United States Senator Judah Benjamin and Scottish Rite Southern Mason leader Albert Pike worked together on this terrorist secession project. There is a bust of Albert Pike in New Orleans, celebrating his work in that pre-war southern base for the Scottish Rite, the Knights, and the B'nai B'rith. Judah Benjamin's relative, his uncle's brother Manny, had earlier written the Masonic Order creating the Scottish Rite organization in which the, the Scottish Rite Northern Organization, in which Wise and Van Rensselaer were now leaders. This order was written by Judah Benjamin's uncle, Brother Manny. To start the Civil War, this pre-organized anti-Union terrorist force would strike for secession in the South. Those who stayed in the North during the war would be known as Copperheads, with headquarters in Ohio. Before the war, Isaac Wise had two B'nai B'rith local leaders in Cleveland, Simon Wolf and Benjamin F. Peik Soto. Wolf and Peik Soto also worked as political agents for Democratic Party boss August Belmont, the United States representative of the Rothschild banks chief money bags to the British Crown and British puppets. Banker Belmont paid for the Knights of the Golden Circle and Young America projects, which he helped plan while he was U.S. Ambassador to the Netherlands. Benjamin Peik Soto was editor of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, a violently pro-Copperhead newspaper that furious citizens forced to shut down during the war. Wolf and Peik Soto ran a Hebrew amateur acting group which included their non-Hebrew friend John Wilkes Booth. The war started in 1861. Simon Wolf went to Washington as the B'nai B'rith representative in the national capital. In Washington, Wolfe joined Albert Pike's Southern Scottish Rite and Judah Benjamin's Confederate Secret Service operations. Wolfe was almost immediately arrested by U.S. Army Counterintelligence Director Lafayette Baker, who worked directly for President Abraham Lincoln and for Lincoln's Secretary of War, Edwin M. Stanton. The B'nai B'rith was understood to be a Confederate intelligence front. Their official history says the cruel and ruthless Colonel Baker had Simon Wolfe arrested, quote, solely because he was a member of B'nai B'rith, unquote. At the time, they say, Wolfe was defending several Southern Jews arrested in Washington and charged with being Confederate spies. Meanwhile, in Cincinnati, Isaac Wise's cohort, Julius Ox, got in trouble when his wife, Bertha, was arrested for smuggling drugs to the Confederate Army in her son's baby carriage. Later, Julius and Bertha Ox's son, the white supremacist Adolf Ox, you can see on the right, married Isaac Wise's daughter, to his right, and then bought the New York Times. Their daughter is here seen marrying Arthur Sulzberger. The U.S. Navy won an 1862 Mississippi River battle, and the U.S. Army took Memphis, Tennessee. Isaac Wise's Memphis B'nai B'rith agent 
the British-born Abraham E. Frankland was arrested and admitted being a Confederate spymaster. Julius Ox sent him supplies in jail the same day, and Frankland was released on a $20,000 bond. We'll hear more of this degenerate Frankland shortly. The next year, B'nai B'rith leader Isaac Wise was nominated at an Ohio convention to run for state senator on the radical anti-union Copperhead election ticket. Wise's running mate for Ohio governor was Clement Volandigham, then in exile in Canada, whom President Lincoln had banished from the country as America's leading traitor. The Benebrith's leader's candidacy caused a crisis and a newspaper scandal. The Cincinnati Jewish community was overwhelmingly pro-union. His own synagogue issued a formal demand for him to withdraw that forced Wise off the ticket. At the close of the war, on April 14, 1865, John Wilkes Booth shot President Abraham Lincoln, while another man simultaneously attacked Secretary of State William Seward. Lincoln died the next day. Here are some basic facts of the murder. Some months before he shot Lincoln, John Wilkes Booth deposited funds in the Montreal, Canada Bank regularly used by the operatives of Confederate Secret Service head Judah Benjamin. John Surratt, a regular Judah <coughs> Benjamin agent, confessed to plotting with Booth to abduct Lincoln and admitted to using that Montreal bank for Benjamin's funds. In the museum that they keep at the assassination site at Ford Theater, the National Park Service displays a coding sheet, a decoding sheet, found by police in John Wilkes Booth's trunk. They display alongside it a matching coding device which was found in the office of Judah Benjamin. At the time John Wilkes Booth shot President Lincoln, Booth's old acquaintance, Benjamin Pake Soto, was international president of the B'nai B'rith. Only hours before going to Ford's theater to shoot the president, Booth met with his old friend, B'nai B'rith Washington Chief Simon Wolf, for a confidential discussion over some drinks. The Willard Hotel. Simon Wolf later claimed that at this meeting, Booth told him about a woman who had turned down Booth's marriage proposal. That evening, Booth murdered Abraham Lincoln, and Wolfe attributed the killing to Booth's anguish over his broken heart. So the lone assassin story of John Hinckley and Jodie Foster is an old story. Simon Wolfe was later a prime founder of the Anti-Defamation League. After the war, the Ku Klux Klan was started up in Tennessee to stop newly freed blacks from voting. With their occult satanic rituals and costumes, the KKK burned and tortured blacks and pro-USA whites. The Klan's national headquarters was Memphis, where KKK leaders Albert Pike and Nathan Bedford Forrest lived and attended lodge together. Memphis B'nai B'rith leader Abraham Frankland was an intimate friend of Albert Pike. Frankland had been in the Pike Benjamin spy apparatus and wrote a blistering attack against the U.S. attempt to reconstruct the South under equal rights. Frankland now stayed on to aid Pike in his post-war satanic task. A notebook of Frankland's Kabbalistic researches 
which is kept in the American Jewish archives in Cincinnati, is a compendium of espionage ciphers, black magic symbols, Masonic ritual, and pagan religion. In his preface, Franklin acknowledges aid to his religious research by Albert Gallatin Mackey, Grand Secretary of the Scottish Rite, and the book Lohar on the Sephiroth, kindly loaned to me by General Albert Pike. KKK boss Pike was simultaneously working on his satanic masterpiece, Morals and Dogma, published in 1871. In his Kabbalistic researches, Franklin lists assorted gods passed down by tradition from ancient times, including four of the 13 great gods of Assyria, Asur, San, Bar, and Yav, plus the god Bel. Mackey writes that Franklin's god Bel is a form of Baal and was worshipped by the Babylonians as their chief deity. This is, of course, the false god which the Old Testament Jewish prophets warn the people against. Mackey says that since 1871, the Royal Arch Masonic System has combined Bel with Jah for Jehovah and On for the Egyptian sun god into Jah Bel On as an explanation for God. The Hebrew menorah, blasphemously used in the Royal Arch Masonic ritual, is displayed in the Alexandria, Virginia Masonic Temple. Other pages of Frank Land's notebook contain cipher and private cipher, philosophical and hermetic alphabet, Cipher of the Rose Cross, and Ten Kabbalistic Spheres. In his Morals and Dogma, KKK boss Albert Pike celebrates the collaboration between these two Memphis Masonic chiefs, Pike and Frankland, at the height of the bloodiest assassination wave in U.S. history. Pike says, one is filled with admiration on penetrating into the sanctuary of the Kabbalah, at seeing a doctrine so logical, so simple, and at the same time so absolute, a philosophy summed up by counting on one's fingers. Ten ciphers and twenty-two letters. A triangle, a square, and a circle. These are all the elements of the Kabbalah. So, as their Ku Klux Klan murdered its way to power, Albert Pike appointed Abraham Franklin the head of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry for the state of Tennessee and an emeritus member of the Supreme Council. Simultaneously, Isaac Wise appointed Abraham Franklin the president of the B'nai B'rith District for Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas. At the beginning of this century, Isaac Wise's grandson, Adolph Ox, the owner of the New York Times, wrote a series of editorials attacking black voting rights in those southern states. This vicious editorial campaign helped swing the North behind the new anti-black Jim Crow laws which were then being written, which finally reversed rights gained by Union blood during the Civil War. The Ox-Sulzberger family, a great power in the B'nai B'rith, 
has remained in control of the New York Times ever since. It is clear that Badai Brit is an abject tool of British intelligence. It is run and directed to serve the interests of British imperial policy and not the interests of Jews nor even of B'nai B'rith members. The one peculiarity of B'nai B'rith in comparison to the other organization, organizations launched by Palmerston and his Three Stooges is that B'nai B'rith will be used for a wider variety of tasks in various countries and epochs. Therefore, B'nai B'rith will be more permanent in its continuous organization than many of its Mazzinian counterparts, among which it stands out as the most specialized. At the end of this 19th century, one of the tasks assigned to B'nai B'rith will be to direct, with the help of other Mazzinian agents, the dismemberment and partition of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. This is the state. It is clear that B'nai B'rith is an abject tool of British intelligence. It is run and directed to serve the interests of British imperial policy and not the interests of Jews nor even of B'nai B'rith members. The one peculiarity of B'nai B'rith in comparison to the other organization, organizations launched by Palmerston and his Three Stooges, is that B'nai B'rith will be used for a wider variety of tasks in various countries and epochs. Therefore, B'nai B'rith will be more permanent in its continuous organization than many of its Mazzinian counterparts, among which it stands out as the most specialized. At the end of this 19th century, one of the tasks assigned to B'nai B'rith will be to direct, with the help of other Mazzinian agents, the dismemberment and partition of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. This is the state the British like to call the sick man of Europe. Historically, the Ottoman Empire has often offered surprising tolerance to its ethnic minorities. To blow up the empire that will have to be changed into brutal racial oppression on the Mazzini model. In 1862, during the time of the American Civil War, Mazzini will call on all his agents anywhere near Russia to foment revolt as a way to cause trouble for Alexander II. A little later, with the help of young Poland, Mazzini will start a young Ottoman movement starting from an Adam Smith translation project in Paris. In 1876, the young Ottomans will briefly seize power in Constantinople. They will put an end to a debt moratorium introduced by the previous government. They will pay the British, declare free trade, and bring in Anglo-American bankers. They will quickly be overthrown, but the same network will soon make a comeback as the young Turks and their rule will finally destroy the Ottoman Empire. In 1908, the Committee for Union and Progress, better known as the Young Turks, carried out a military coup, overthrew the Sultan, and took power in the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Once in power, they carried out a racist campaign of suppressing all non-Turkish minorities. Within four years of coming into power, their anti-minority campaigns had provoked the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913 among Turkey, Greece, Bulgaria, and Serbia. By 1914, these wars had triggered World War I, with Turkey becoming an ally of Germany. Within seven years of coming into power, the Young Turks had destroyed the Ottoman Empire. British intelligence had manipulated every nationalist group in the empire, both the Young Turks and their opponents. 
When the Young Turks took power, the Ottoman Empire still included Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Palestine, and the Arabian Peninsula. The empire still included much of the Balkans, half of Greece, half of Bulgaria, half of Serbia, and all of Albania were still part of the empire. The Ottoman Empire is shown here in yellow. As you can see, it was much bigger than present-day Turkey. The dark areas were part of the British Empire. The hatched area was Russian. Although most of the population of the Ottoman Empire were Turks, there were a large number of Slavs, Greeks, Arabs, Armenians, and Kurds. The Ottoman Empire was a multi-ethnic empire, as were the nearby Austrian and Russian empires. When the Young Turks came into power, they were waving the banner of democracy, but they soon picked up the banner of Pan-Turkism. This map shows what they called the Pan-Turkic homeland. As you see here, the idea was to form a state that included all the Turkic peoples of Asia. Now, since half of these people lived in Russia, this policy necessarily meant a collision with Russia. But Pan-Turkism was not created by the Young Turks or even in Turkey. It was first called for in the 1860s by a Hungarian Zionist named Arminius Van Brie, who had become an advisor to the Sultan, but who secretly worked for Lord Palmerston and the British Foreign Office. Van Brie later tried to broker a deal between the Zionist leader Theodore Herzl and the Sultan over the creation of Israel. The Young Turks also raised the banner of a pan-Islamic state. The idea was to bring all Muslim peoples of the world into one empire, whether or not they were Turkish. This was another goal that necessarily meant conflict with Russia. This idea also was not created by the Young Turks or even in Turkey. It was first called for in the 1870s by an English nobleman named Wilfred Blunt, whose family had created the Bank of England. Blunt was a top British intelligence official who advocated using Islam to destroy Russia. Blunt's family later patronized the British KGB spy, Kim Philby. While the Young Turks were pushing the pan-Turkic and pan-Islamic movements, the British were also boosting all the anti-Turkish independence movements within the empire. They were supporting Arab nationalism, led by Lawrence of Arabia. They were supporting Serbian nationalism, led by the British agent Seton Watson, Albanian nationalism, led by Lady Dunham, and Bulgarian nationalism, led by Noel Buxton of Oxford. All these peoples wanted to break free from the Ottoman Empire, but they also all claimed the land of their neighbors. For example, the British supported the idea of carving a greater Armenia out of Turkey, Iran, and Russia. This, great, this is greater Armenia. This greater Armenia had no possibility of ever existing. None of the powers, including Britain, wanted it. They didn't really want it. The Kurds who lived in the same area didn't want it. But the British told the Armenians that they supported the Armenian plans. However, at the same time, the British were also telling the Kurds who lived in the same region that they supported the idea of Greater Kurdistan, as you see here. And as you see, Greater Kurdistan and Greater Armenia are almost identical. Now, in 1915, during World War I, the Kurds killed about one million Armenians. The young Turks, who had been put in power by the British, used the Kurds, who thought they had the support of the British, to slaughter the Armenians, who also thought they had the support of the British. The British then used this genocide as a justification for trying to eliminate uh, Turkey. In fact, the next year, the British and French got together the plan the division of the Ottoman Empire between themselves. Here is the plan. What would become Turkey is indicated in yellow. According to this plan, which only partially succeeded, Turkey itself would be reduced to a tiny area on the Black Sea, and the rest of the empire would go to Britain and France in order to avenge the killing of the Armenians. Now, who were these young Turks who could so efficiently destroy the empire? Well, the founder of the Young Turks was an Italian, the neighborhood official, named Emmanuel Carrasso. 
Carrasso set up the Young Turk Secret Society in the 1890s in Salonika, then part of Turkey and now part of Greece. Carrasso was also the Grand Master of an Italian Masonic lodge there called Macedonia Resurrected. The lodge was the headquarters of the Young Turks, and all the Young Turk leadership were members of this lodge. The Italian Masonic lodges in the Ottoman Empire, of which Macedonia Resurrected was a leading example, had been set up by a follower of Giuseppe Mazzini named Emmanuel Veneziano, who was also a leader of the B'nai B'rith's European affiliate, the Universal Israelite Alliance. During the Young Turk regime, Carrasso continued to play a leading role. He met with the Sultan to tell him when he was uh, overthrown. He was in charge of putting the Sultan under house arrest. He ran the Young Turk intelligence network in the Balkans, and he was in charge of all food supplies in the empire during World War I. Now, another important area was the press. While in power, the Young Turks ran several newspapers, including one, appropriately enough, entitled The Young Turk. Its editor was none other than the Russian Zionist leader, Vladimir Jabotinsky. Here we see Jabotinsky a few years later in the British Army in World War I. Now, Jabotinsky had been educated as a young man in Italy. He later describes Mazzini's ideas as the basis for the Zionist movement. Jabotinsky arrived in Turkey shortly after the young Turks seized power to take over the paper. The paper was owned, owned by a member of the Turkish cabinet, but it was funded by the Russian Zionist Federation and managed by B'nai B'rith. The editorial policy of this paper, The Young Turk, was overseen by a Dutch Zionist named Jacob Kahn, who happened to be the personal banker of the King and Queen of the Netherlands. Jabotinsky later created the most anti-Arab of all the Zionist organizations, the Irgun. His followers in Israel today are the ones most violently opposed to the Perez Arafat peace accords. Now, another associate of Karasa was Alexander Helfand, better known as Parvis, the financier of the 1905 and 1917 Russian revolutions. Here we see Parvis with Leon Trotsky in Russia in 1905. Shortly after this picture was taken, uh, Parvis moved to Turkey, where he became the economics editor of another young Turk newspaper called the Turkish Homeland. Parvis became a business partner of Carrasso in the grain trade and an arms supplier to the Turkish army during the Balkan Wars. He later returned to Europe to arrange the secret train that took Lenin back to Russia in 1917. Well, of course, there were also some Turks who helped lead this young Turk movement. A few. This is one, for example, Talat Pasha. Talat was the interior minister and the dictator of the regime during World War I. He had been a member of Carrasso's Italian Masonic Lodge in Salonika. One year prior to the 1908 coup, Talat became the Grand Master of the Scottish Rite Masons in the Ottoman Empire. And if you go to the Scottish Rite headquarters in Washington, D.C. today, you can find that most of the Young Turk leaders were officials in the Scottish Rite. But who founded the Scottish Rite in Turkey? Well, one of the founders was the Grand Master of the Scottish Rite in France, Adolphe Cremieux, who also happened to be the head of the B'nai B'rith's European affiliate. Now, Cremieux had been a leader of Mazzini's Young France and helped put the British stooge Napoleon III into power. Well, you can't find the story of the young, you can only find the story of the Young Turks in the B'nai B'rith and Scottish Rite archives. You can't find it in the history books. The best public account, however, is found in a novel, a British novel called Green Mantle, whose hero was a British spy who secretly led the Young Turks. Carrasso does appear in this novel under the name Caruso. The author, John Buchan, who was a British intelligence official in World War I, later identified the novel's hero as Aubrey Herbert. In real life, Herbert was from one of the most powerful noble families in England. In fact, his family held less, no less than four earldoms. His repeated contact with Carrasso and other Young Turk leaders is a matter of public record. Herbert's grandfather had been a patron of Mazzini and died leading revolutionary mobs in Italy in 1848. 
His father was in charge of British masonry in the 1880s and 1890s. His uncle was the British ambassador to the United States. During World War I, Herbert was the top British spy master in the Middle East, and Lawrence of Arabia later identified Herbert, who was his boss, as having been, at one time, the real head of the Young Turks. While the U.S. State Department also played a role in the conspiracy, from 1890 through World War I, there were, no, there were three U.S. ambassadors to Turkey, all of whom were in close contact with the Young Turks. One was Oscar Strauss, another was Abraham Elkin, and the third was Henry Morgenthau. All three were close friends of Simon Wolf, and all three were top officials in the B'nai B'rith. The B'nai B'rith networks will have a devastating impact on the culture of the 20th century. Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, will be a leading member of the B'nai B'rith Lodge of Vienna, Austria, during the twilight of the Habsburg Empire. Freud later will cordially thank the members of his lodge for their support during his arduous early years in psychoanalysis. Indeed, several members of the Lodge will provide the initiating cadre who, along with Freud, will found the quackery of psychoanalysis. This Freud will be a charlatan and a Kabbalist. The anti-Semitism of Freud and of B'nai B'rith as an organization of British intelligence at the expense of Jews will be perhaps most clearly documented in Freud's last major work, Moses and Monotheism. Freud's hatred for creativity and the human mind will be documented in his essay on Leonardo da Vinci, in which he will assert, on the basis of no evidence whatsoever, that Leonardo was a homosexual. Later, the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research will be founded with the program of merging Marx with Freud. One of the pillars of the Frankfurt School will be Max Horkheimer. After the Second World War, Horkheimer will be instrumental in refounding and reorganizing the Nybrith in Frankfurt. The Frankfurt School will provide the matrix for the youth culture and counterculture of the post-war decades, in the same way that Mazzini, the high priest of Romanticism, has used his youth cults to shape the first half of the 19th century. So, tell me, about how long have you been feeling depressed? <laughs> Laughter is a defense mechanism. <laughs> Since you clearly have a problem with this, we could come back to it later. Perhaps it would be best if, if you wish to enter psychoanalysis with me, that I tell you a little bit about how I go about things. I'm not really a strict Freudian psychoanalyst. Almost no one is a strict Freudian these days. But the old boy does have his influence. It's amazing, you know. Sigmund Freud's scientific credibility was almost destroyed. Yet, right after World War II, his ideas became the most widely discussed ideas in America. Do you know why he became so popular? Because he said it was okay to be a pessimist. He proved that if you were unhappy, it was okay, and it wasn't your fault. And I can't help noticing that you personally don't appear very pessimistic. As a matter of fact, you look somewhat optimistic. And too much optimism is exactly how a lot of people get depressed. You know, they think that the, they can solve the problems of the whole world. All you have to do is to get people to act rationally. And you 
fail and you just make yourself depressed. And Sigmund Freud understood that. He understood that down deep people aren't reasonable. That's why my old psychoanalysis teacher, Erich Fromm, said back in 1970 that psychoanalysis was really the science of the irrational. Anyway, this optimism stuff is 135 years out of date. What's that poem? Ah. Ah, love, let us be true to one another for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. Now that is pessimism. Matthew Arnold, Dover Beach, 1859. And you know, before 1859, people generally didn't write poetry that pessimistic. That, by the way, was the same year that Charles Darwin published Origin of, of Species, the book that really got people to look at the human race realistically. Most people think that Darwin's book is about evolution, and it, it's not really. As a matter of fact, Darwin didn't even use the word evolution in the first edition. The, real t the full title of the first edition tells it all. On the origin of species by means of natural selection, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Darwin got people to realize that life is not progress or development, but is an endless struggle for survival. So you can't be optimistic, because how things turn out is not a question of morality. It's a question of biology, over which you and I, my friend, have very little control. Darwin's propagandist, Charles Huxley, Thomas Huxley, I think he said it best. I have the quote, just a sec. Here. I know of no study which is so utterly saddening as that of the evolution of humanity. Man emerges with the marks of his lowly origin strong upon him. He is a brute, only more intelligent than other brutes, a blind prey to impulses a victim to endless illusions which make his mental existence a burden and fill his life with barren toil and battle. This stuff changed the world back in the 1860s and 70s. Everyone had to explain the universe in terms of Darwin. Even Hermann Helmholtz, the mechanistic physicist, told his colleagues that the struggle for existence was the highest principle of explanation in the face of which not even the molecules and the stars in heaven are safe. And Sigmund Freud said that the two most important influences on his life were Charles Darwin and Hermann Helmholtz. He even tried to study with Huxley in London and Helmholtz in Berlin. You see, what Freud did was take the blind mechanical forces of biology described by Darwin and show that they operated in the human mind. For instance, people get the idea that they can help the whole human race. But Freud told us that this was an illusion, like religion. Freud realized that if you get the idea that you can help all humanity to survive and grow, that this idea is actually your own desire to survive and reproduce, your own individual sexual urges, channeled, uh, what we call sublimated, into a more socially acceptable form. Look at Freud's case history of Leonardo da Vinci. Maybe the greatest combination of artist and scientist in the entire history of the human race. Do you think that Leonardo was moved by some Harvard, har higher purpose? No way. It's sex. It's always sex. Freud said, sex starts even before you're born. Right from the start, you are biologically impelled to explore the physical world. 
That's where you get your ideas, from groping around in the world of the senses. And for centuries, people thought that this erotic groping around was somehow a bad thing. But Freud helped us to understand that this was natural, that you've got these instinctual erotic drives, these irrational little demons in your head, and you can't do that much about it. So, for most people, this eroticism becomes totally inhibited by religion or some other problem, or it gets repressed by childhood experiences and transformed into neurosis. But Freud said that the reason why Leonardo da Vinci was such a genius was that he was one of those rare individuals whose erotic drives became perfectly sublimated. According to Freud, Leonardo effectively never grew up like Michael Jackson. <laughs> For Leonardo, scientific and artistic investigation became the substitute for sexual activity. As, he, as Sigmund Freud said, Leonardo became a complete narcissist, the ideal homosexual type. Homosexual? No, no. Psychoanalysis understands that it's really not a perversion. It's just one of many ways healthy ways by which we all deal with our rational drive. Anyway, Freud said that all people are naturally bi bisexual. Well, I can see that you are still somewhat afraid of this subject. <laughs> Perhaps we can deal with this problem later on in your therapy. Under any circumstances, you have got to be realistic. It is absurd to worry about universal truths. The only universals are these mechanical forces in your brains and in your pants. And each person comes up with his or her own more or less successful way of reconciling these forces with the experience that you receive in the course of growing up. By the whole history of social science, from Freud and almost every psychologist, plus all of almost all of sociology and almost all of anthropology is one great effort to prove that you can't judge a truth in terms of all mankind. Truth is relative to the individual. And what is more, truth, what is more, you have to accept that your mind is not truly free. Biology means that you can never completely control these erotic little demons inside your head. So don't set your sights unrealistically high. The only thing that you can hope to discover in this world, with the help of professionals like me, is how to be well-adjusted. Well, of course I can't prove it. Psychoanalysis cannot clinically prove that the unconscious, the id, dream analysis, the Oedipus complex, any important Freudian concept actually exists. Freud said that psychoanalysis was like a religion. You can't prove it, but you accept it on faith. As a matter of fact, Carl Jung once wrote a letter to Freud saying, maybe we should start acting more like a form of religion. But Freud said this is a little bit too premature. Actually, I think that this religious aspect of psychoanalysis is what attracted the Frankfurt School to Freud in the 1930s. I should probably tell you that, like many psychoanalysts today, I came to Freud via the Frankfurt School. You know, Erich Fromm, Herbert Marcuse, uh, Horkheimer, Adorno. This Hungarian fellow named Georg Lukács founded the Frankfurt School because he was trying to determine how to cause massive social change. Lukács was specifically interested in Bolshevism, but the technique works for other ideologies. <laughs> Lukács said that you have to make people completely pessimistic. You have to make them believe that they live in a world abandoned by God, as he put it. And at the same time, the new social movement that you're trying to create has to have certain key similarities to religion, but of course without a concept of a supreme being. In fact, 
Lukash seriously investigated the Baal Shem cult, a, a Jewish Kabbalistic sect, as well as several medieval Christian heresies in order to find what he called the messianic ideas that could be incorporated into successful Bolshevik organizing. And Freudian theory fit this bill completely. It was just like going back to the Gnostic cults of the Middle Ages. The demons were back. The evil was being generated out of your own head, and you needed a new priesthood to save you. It was the Frankfurt School's extension of Freud that was the major reason that psychoanalysis became so influential in every aspect of American life. The Frankfurt School helped us all to discover how really bad our mental health was, how we had to liberate ourselves from the authoritarian constraints that made us neurotic, that we had to resist the imposition of universal values and embrace a healthy personal hedonism. Now, as your psychoanalyst, I hate to admit it, but even though Freud had a great model for the individual mind, his social psychology was a disaster. But the Frankfurt School solved that. Freud had said that the individual identity was based on the interaction of biology, the instinctual drives embedded in man's hereditary structure, with the experiences of growing to maturity within the family. Freud thought that all people were more or less the same because the instinctual drives were the same and the family structures were more or less, or less the same. The Frankfurt School corrected this by emphasizing that each culture, each people, each race have important differences in their psychologies because their differing family structures transmit the ideas of authority, of value, of morality in different ways. So, if you want to liberate your eros and become healthy, the most important thing to do is to find what separates one culture, one people, one race from another one. The differences don't have to be in the genes. I mean, today, very few people will admit publicly that black people are biologically different from white people. It just isn't done. Frankfurt School emphasized what Freud only hinted at. Cultural differences transmitted through the family are as rigid and as powerful as biological differences. And thus, they prove that black people are fundamentally different from white people because their cultures are different. And a lot of people in this country supported and sponsored the Frankfurt School because they were able to use Freud's psychoanalytic theory to demonstrate scientifically that all values must be relative. And that is why today, everybody, everybody, you, me, except for a few extremists and religious fanatics, everybody understands that universal values are really authoritarian and that the family structure has got to be changed, maybe even destroyed, to stop imposing these obsolete values on our young. Anyway, in the modern world, in the post-industrial society, we no longer need, we can no longer afford this authoritarian sense of the power over nature which the patriarchal family structure transmits. Today, the most important aspect of mental health is giving people an identity that will make them happy and erotically satisfied. And this was the great original contribution of the Frankfurt School after World War II, when they worked with several Jewish organizations to create a new identity for American Jews. The Frankfurt School said that henceforth, Jewish identity would be defined not by religious belief, not by the ideas through which Jews contributed to the rest of humanity, but by the Holocaust. Jews would be trained to see themselves primarily as victims of genocide. And this worked fantastically. Even today, Jews who think that the B'nai B'rith are a bunch of crooks still give them money because they have been trained to believe that Jews are profoundly different from everyone else. 
and that anti-Semites are everywhere waiting to start the new Holocaust at any moment. And this Jewish identity project works so well that we, Frankfurt School Freudians, were asked to do the same thing for black people. In the 1960s, many black people were successfully retrained to believe that what really defined their identity was how their African ancestors had been enslaved, enslaved by white people. We did the same thing for women. The feminist movement used the Frankfurt School and Freudian theory to help millions of women understand, realize, that their real identity is defined by male chauvinism. You see how successful we have been Today, it's everywhere. We teach it in the schools. It's called multiculturalism. Everyone gets an identity based on who raped who. <laughs> the Latin Americans understand that the most important thing is to get back at the Spanish colonialism the Native Americans understand that the most important thing is to get back at the whites. Everyone separated from everyone else. Fear, hatred, revenge, sure we give them that. But we give them an identity. And they are We've spent too much time talking about what I think. <laughs> we should be talking more about what you think, but uh, I see that our time is up. Uh, I can fit you in next week. Uh, Tuesday? Uh, the short session is usually $75. You can pay as you leave. Today, in 1850, Great Britain and the United States are two traditional enemies who are moving towards their third military conflict after the American Revolution and the War of 1812. During the Civil War, the United States and Russia will together confront Lord Palmerston with a kind of League of Cambrai nightmare. The specter of these two great powers arrayed against the British Empire and its stooges in a world war that London would almost certainly lose. After Gettysburg, the British will resign themselves to the continued existence of the United States for some time to come. They will rather focus their endeavors on using the United States and its power as a weapon in their own hands against Germany, Japan, Russia, and the developing countries. The British will discover the myth of the English-speaking peoples. They will argue that Anglo-Saxon blood and soil are more important than the ideas of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Cultural and financial subjugation of the United States will go together with military exploitation. The Specie Resumption Act, the control of the U.S. public debt by London's J.P. Morgan, and the presidencies of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson will mark the way towards the so-called special relationship, American muscle working for the brain in London. And under these auspices, British geopolitics will organize two world wars and 40 years of the Cold War. From the years 
1866 to 1871, the United States witnessed the most revolutionary legislative and constitutional process in its history since the founding of the nation in 1787 through 89. It was the revolutionary state legislatures of the South that were the theater of that transformation. We may gain a visual sense of, that trans of, that, of the swiftness of that transformation by viewing three illustrations. First is of Frederick Douglass. Douglass, together with John Quincy Adams and Lincoln, was America's most eloquent voice in defense of the Constitution. Douglas had been born a slave. These are his sons who fought against their father's former slavery in the War of 1860 to 65. Finally, there is Douglas and his grandson, Joseph. Joseph Douglas was also a violinist and played Schubert duets with his grandfather, Frederick Douglass, also a violinist. From slave to freeman to soldier to artist. The evolution of the Douglass family was in one sense the evolution of mankind that Schiller called for in his essay on the aesthetic education of man. Schiller said, every individual man carries a purely ideal man within himself. This pure man who gives himself to be recognized more or less distinctly in every subject is represented through the state. It is his objective form in which the multiplicity of subjects strives to unite itself. Now, however, let two different ways be considered how the state can maintain itself in the individual. Either that the pure man suppresses the empirical, that the state abolishes the individual, or that the individual becomes the state, that the man of time ennobles himself to the man in the idea. Schiller had also, as an historian, written a seminal study on the legislation of the poet Solon of Athens, who abolished slavery in his famous constitution, as opposed to the laws of Lycurgus of Sparta, whose well-ordered society depended on slavery to function. Lincoln had spoken of the tragic dimensions of the American conflict most eloquently in his second inaugural address of 1864. One eighth, he said, one eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union even by war. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Each side read the same Bible. Each side prays to the same God. And each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us not judge that we be not judged. Indeed, between 1863's Emancipation Proclamation and the 1873-76 counter-revolution of the Ku Klux Klan, a great tragedy of truly classical dimensions would take place, one in which the conflict between the notion of a social order as promulgated by Solon of Lycurgus, briefly triumphed o over the slave order, of, excuse me, Solon, Solon of Athens, briefly triumphed over the slave order of Lycurgus of Sparta that had been in existence in the United States up to that time. Nor were the protagonists in the drama unaware of the central issue. In South Carolina, 
black and white debating societies had discussed the topic of Solon versus Lycurgus from the time of the 1840s. The exact topic was, quote, whether the laws of Lycurgus or of Solon are most likely to bring about a condition of happiness in the constitutional state. But by 1865, the chief protagonist of this drama, Abraham Lincoln, lay dead, assassinated by a conspiracy run by the Scottish Rite of Freemasons on behalf of the British Empire. And though there were great men throughout America, and though there were individuals who well understood the revolution on which they were embarked, there was no individual who was capable other than the slain Lincoln of understanding, communicating, and actualizing this revolution. With the Hayes-Tilden Compromise of 1876, the counter-revolution led by the Scottish Rite in the form of the Ku Klux Klan turned the tide in a way that they were unable to do on the battlefield of 1860 to 65. When the battle shifted to irregular war, the Patriots lost and the race Patriots won. Our time is entirely dominated by and determined by the failure to win that irregular war with the Scottish Rite of Freemasons and its most active deployment, the B'nai B'rith. The assassinations of Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Robert Kennedy, the attempts against the lives of others, the harassment and extermination of other political movements, the control of the media, these things would not be possible except for the Jim Crow cultural war won by the Scottish Rite. Rather than focus on the invention of those pseudoscientific frauds known as sociology, anthropology, psychology, and the social sciences more generally, and all degrees granted in these fields can be seen to be essentially worthless, we will focus on a critical cultural dynamic that to this day defines the modes of behavior of virtually the entire American population. This is called Jim Crow. Jim Crow refers to a popular form of entertainment in the United States of the period of the 1820s. It's also known as the minstrel show. It comes from an actor, a white actor, who viewed a crippled black slave doing a dance and copied the crippled slave's dance and called it Jumpin' Jim Crow. We see that the idea of black people as lazy, shiftless, no good was made central to the political propaganda of the United States in the period immediately after the Civil War. There are the coon songs, the coon songs of the period of the 1880s and 1890s, which greeted Dvorak when he came to America at that time to attempt to create the National Conservatory of Music. There were the various forms of snide and clearly racist humor. And finally, there was the minstrel show. Jim Crow is usually identified with the set of laws that were passed starting about 1901 that codified segregation throughout the South. In 1868, the South Carolina legislature mandated public education for the black and white population and gave every male over 21 the right to vote. This predominantly black legislature enfranchised the white male population, 90% of whom had not owned enough property to be eligible to vote prior to the war. Integration of schools, including colleges, became law in 1868. In Alabama, which would be the site of the 1956 Montgomery bus boycott, public transportation was fully desegregated in 1869. All of this, as well as the election of African Americans to the United States Senate and Congress, 
or to governorships of states would be swept away by Jim Crow. But Jim Crow represented a cultural value which was in the ascendancy in the late 19th century and whose major spokesmen were British or Anglo-American. These were the people that believed that the Northwest states of the United States should be preserved as an Anglo-Saxon estate for a Nordic-based racial stock. These were the people that would found the Immigration Restriction League and would eventually, by 1924, severely restrict the immigration of Eastern Europeans, Italians, and other Mediterranean peoples to this country. Ultimately, it would be because of these restrictions, in part, that when Jews would attempt to flee Europe because of the rise of fascism, they would not be admitted to the United States. And it would be the Joint Distribution Committee and the Anti-Defamation League that would oppose anti-Nazi activity by Jewish organizations in the United States. We do not exaggerate in referring to, our, uh, to uh, the Palmerston Zoo. Anthropology, otherwise properly known by its original name of race science, was introduced in America by putting primitive races on exhibit in St. Louis in 1904. Humanity was said to have evolved from the most primitive, the pygmies of the Congo, to the brown races, then to the red, then to the yellow, then to the white. The American Museum of Natural History advocated this theory and stuffed an ex Eskimo and put him on exhibit. At the Bronx Zoo, William Temple Hornaday placed the pygmy Otabenga on exhibit as the missing link between the ape and man, as the exemplar of primitive man. And that exhibit was maintained throughout 1905-1906 at the Bronx Zoo. In the last three years, we have exposed the FBI program known as Primitive Man, or Frumention, a racist program to target African-American politicians who are, make up a, a minuscule percentage of elected officials, but the preponderance of corruption cases in the United States. To understand the roots of this, you must understand the racist roots of anthropology. You must also understand that it was the movie Birth of a Nation that had given this characterization in its attack on the South Carolina legislature to all black political fig figures that would follow. J. Edgar Hoover's war against Martin Luther King is easily explained by his having headed the Kappa Alpha fraternity at George Washington University, the college organization of the Ku Klux Klan. Hoover's task was conceived to be like that of Ota Benga's captor and benefactor, Samuel Phillips Verner. Put the apes in the zoo, in the pen where they belong. But not only the right-wingers believed in race theory, in race science, or in eugenics, you had a practice ongoing simultaneous with this of a, a renewed slavery in the Congo. Leopold of Belgium exacted for his rubber trade and for the labor required a high penalty. When laborers were unable to meet the quota, they were dealt with accordingly. But not only the right-wingers believed in race theory, in race science, in eugenics in America. Woodrow Wilson, former president of Princeton University and later president of the United States, was the leading promoter of the Confederate Klan myth that was the basis in America for the toleration of the resurgence of the Klan in 1915, for which purpose the movie Birth of a Nation was made. The Klan's major deployment was, however, not against blacks in 1915, but against German-Americans 
and those who argued that the United States should not ally with the British in World War I. Wilson's father had been a Confederate officer in the, eight, in, in the, war, in the Civil War and had taught Mazzini's theories of race revolution at, uh, and, at, Prince, at Princeton. Mazzini had supported the, the Confederacy and the abolitionist cause because in his schema, both the Confederacy and the abolitionist secessionist movement could be used to divide the nation, so long as Lincoln's and Douglas's constitutional perspective were not to prevail. Wilson's way had been paved by the arch-racist Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt, who had been president for two terms prior to Wilson, paved the way for Wilson's election through a third-party tactic called the Bull Moose Party. Roosevelt today is immortalized in front of the, of the Race Patriot Center, the Museum of Natural History, in a statue. And the statue represents the superiority of the so-called white race over the colored races. We also remind the audience that George Bush kept a picture of Teddy Roosevelt on his wall throughout his occupation of the Oval Office. Henry Fairfield Osborne, president of the Museum of Natural History, his associate Madison Grant, the trustee of the New York Zoological Society, and Bernard Baruch, a Jewish businessman and part of a Southern Confederate Jewish slaveholding family, among others, promoted the pseudoscience of eugenics along with Averill Harriman, later to become the major mover and shaker in the Democratic Party. The museum sponsored during the 1930s a conference on eugenics and had Dr. Ernst Rudin Hitler's top race scientist come to that conference and he was given an award. Abel Harriman was, until his death in 1986, a major force in the Democratic Party opposition to Lyndon LaRouche. The first Pike campaign that would be carried out by the LaRouche forces was launched against Harriman, Teddy Roosevelt, and the Museum of Natural History in 1982. It caused Senator Pat Moynihan famous for his racist attacks on the African-American family and his policy of benign neglect toward the poor of America's cities to deploy his campaign manager, Eric Brindell, a former heroin addict, now editorial page editor of the New York Post and board member of the ADL, to denounce the LaRouche forces as racist and anti-Semitic. This came from the defenders of the major American institution in support of Hitler's racial policies, the Museum of Natural History. The crime was that the LaRouche forces had attacked the Palmerston Zoo, to whose defense the Spalpeen Moynihan would always hasten. Why does America tolerate this? Americans tolerate this because they are in large measure particularly since the Kennedy and King assassinations, creatures in a multicultural zoo. A teacher in the Washington, D.C. area recently supplied insight into the results of the several years of emphasis on multiculturalism in schools and society in America. In a survey he did of his class of 29 pupils, 24 of whom are black, he found that the students held the following beliefs. Blacks are poor and stay poor because they are dumber than whites. Black people don't like to work hard. Black people have to be bad so they can fight and defend themselves from other blacks. As students, they see their, the, the students see that their badness is natural. They don't mean any disrespect to the teachers, it's just how they are. Black men make women pregnant and leave. Black boys expect to die young and unnaturally. White people are smart and have money. Asians are smart and make money. Asians don't like blacks or Hispanics. Hispanics are more like blacks than whites. They can't be white so they try to be black. 
Hispanics are poor and don't try hard because like blacks they know it doesn't matter. The teacher was mystified, but he failed to recognize that multiculturalism is simply high technology stereotyping. Let us look at the problem of racial stereotyping. Let us take the case of the African American male. The African American male falls into seven stereotypes. This is not to assert that the individuals which are, will be represented for the stereotype necessarily conform to such, they may have other substance. The first stereotype is Bubba, the super athlete. White men can't jump, but they can add. There is Reverend Chicken Wing. <laughs> there is Step and Fetch It. There is Nat Turner. There is Superfly. There is Michael Jackson. <laughs> there is Dr. Professor General I am half white. May I have it? May I have it? Oh, we do have it. <laughs> there is Kuwaka, I was black before y'all. <laughs> and there are the Jim Crow variations. Now, these individuals may have other substance as real people. They may be induced or encouraged or forced to act out a stereotype. However, they are only socially recognizable in the guise of the cultural stereotype to which they conform. Otherwise, they are invisible or non-existent or dead. The purpose of multiculturalism is to suggest to the African-American male that these are the limitations of his identity. All of the roles do not preclude, for example, sexual promiscuity, a trait presumed by, the st by, the ter by all stereotypes to be virtually, if not actually, genetic. If you do not correspond to one of these stereotypes as an African-American male, you are, as the author Ralph Ellison termed it, an invisible man. If you assert your existence through some act or thought, you threaten the master-slave relationship between the zookeepers and the animals. There is only one way out for you. Conform to the stereotype or die. Here are some images of people who did not conform to racial stereotyping. There is Harry Burley. There is Roland Hayes. There is Marian Anderson. There are the Fisk Jubilee Singers. There are other contemporary figures that also do not conform. There is Adam Clayton Powell, the congressman. Malcolm X and Hewlin Jack, 
one of the founders of the National Democratic Policy Committee of Lyndon LaRouche. There is Martin Luther King, who, though he is said to have conformed to a stereotype, as you can see, was not regarded as having conformed to stereotype. And there are others. There is Minister Louis Farrakhan. And there's Lyndon the Root. These are figures whose images evoke discomfort. Think of how they are described. Extremists. But what does that term actually mean? Not clearly on the left or right. But what does that phrase actually mean? A threat to our notion of the democratic process. But what does that mean? It is not the cognitive meaning that is significant here. It is the affective meaning. The sense of uneasiness. Of vague upset. Of they just aren't the right kind of people-ness. Which is essential. That affective meaning is the generator of stereotyping. When you are caused to empathize in so-called non-cognitive education with how people feel about something, rather with, than with how they think about something, you will generate stereotyping, not discourage it. The major weapon of the Scottish Rite of Freemasons in the destruction of the American Revolution, successfully waged by Lincoln and others, was the assertion of Jim Crow as a cultural value determinant. It was, it was against this that Martin Luther King, uniquely of all Americans, rallied the nation as a whole, not its African-American population solely. Today, the ADL, using multiculturalism, seeks to wipe out the African-American intellectual, not only out of racism, but because such other, such intelligence might become one catalyst to freeing all the other animals in the theme park. King's message is well contained in the statement of Paul, the apostle, that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. That advanced statement of Christian civilization, which became the street practice of America's citizens in the 1960s through the Civil Rights Movement is still the key to unlocking the chains of illusion that keep us imprisoned in the multicultural zoo. Towards the end of the 20th century, in the storms of the breakdown crisis that will follow the end of the confrontation between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, human beings will be forced to choose between two conflicting definitions of themselves. On the one hand, they will be able to choose, as human beings always are, creative reason, scientific discovery, and a true world order, a community of principle of sovereign nations seeking progress through economic development. If the men and women of those coming days are able to lift their eyes to the stars, they may be able to cease killing one another in order to possess a few square miles of mud on one small planet. If they are capable of recognizing the inherent universality of the human personality, the equality of each person as imago viva dei, then the domain of humanity 
will be without limit. But in those same days, the heirs of Mazzini and Lord Palmerston and Benai Brit, the servants of a dying British Empire, will try to pull the world with them into the abyss. They will argue sense certainty. They will say that human identity is that of an ethnic group and that ethnicity controls man's destiny as it does among the animal species. They will tell the Americans of the melting pot and so many others around the world who have no ethnic identity that they must acquire a synthetic one. They will rewrite history around a thousand false centers in order to deny that the cause of human progress is one. Nor will the minds of the little children be exempted from these torments. Others will talk of multiculturalism in an age in which the human image will be lacerated and violated and immolated as never before in the face of all the nations. And if these voices should prevail, then surely an eon of darkness will cover the world. When Palmerston ranted his Kiwis Romanus Sum in the Parliament here in Westminster just a short time ago, he thought that the empire was made and that there would never be a reply. But a reply will come after the British drive for empire will have fallen short. Thirteen years from now, when Abraham Lincoln will stand among the new graves of a small Pennsylvania crossroads town and promise that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth.